just want everyone to know we're broadcasting on Facebook and we are now recording. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> yeah. Let's give it another minute or so here. I think we just about have everybody. Sorry, join just in time so you can hear my dog barking. That's okay. And are we gonna add the attendees to the meeting as well, Sarah? Oh, add the attendees. Let me see. Lisa Ostergaard and John Isaacson. I'm assuming he can join us now, right? Even well, though I mean, technically he hasn't been sworn in yet. Right. Um, but if you want him to join, I don't think it's a huge issue. Do you want me to put, I'll, I'll bring him over. Yeah, I think just, yeah, that would be nice. Okay. It's so hard when we're not in person, you know? <laughs> yeah. And Alyssa. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll go ahead and call the uh, Tuesday, January 4th, uh, Duval City Council Committee of the Whole meeting to order at 531. And um, just want to start off, I guess, if, with the good of the order, if anyone has any, any council members have anything to bring up at this time. Uh, council member Langel, Hogue, and then Matt one. Um, this is just um, an observation, and I think it's a really positive one. When the streets have been plowed, um, and you know I've waved, and other people have waved, it's really nice to see the public works drivers wave back. Um, I think it really sends a positive message about public works and about the city as a whole. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool. <laughs> they are so awesome. Thanks for bringing that up, Dot. Uh, Council Member Hogue. I just wanted to mention, I know that we've got some vacancies in our committees. So is there, are we planning in January, like it maybe, or is, does that happen at our next retreat to start filling the committees? Yeah, I was thinking about bringing that up, adding that on to our chat when we talk about the agenda for the retreat, because we were thinking about maybe having the retreat a little later, maybe February, just so to make sure that new council member will be able to join as well. So. If that's the case, I don't know if we want to just hang tight on what we have for committees until we get to that, but we can talk about that more in a little bit if that's okay. Council Member Naplin. Yeah, this is super quick. I just wanted to um, acknowledge the report we received from the fire chief and um, it got me thinking about how much I appreciate just as a council member and as a community member learning about what kind of calls we're getting, what volume of calls, and it occurred to me that it might be nice to have that um, for our community from our police department internally as well. Uh, so I don't know if, you know, just as I'm guessing public safety committee, you know, has an opportunity to ask questions and, and gets, you know, some regular reports on what's happening, but it's possible the community and I know myself, I would, I would be curious um, of, you know, what kind of calls are we getting? What's our call volume? um you know what's happening in the department i i think uh i would enjoy that and it would be useful information so i don't know how to officially request that or if that's something that the public safety committee can um have a conversation about you know what kind of information might be desired mayor can i just chime in here mayor i was going to ask i know i've seen these kinds of reports before but just not super consistently are those things that are already generated and could just be forwarded to council on whatever uh, frequency they happen, whether it's monthly or quarterly? Um, we we did for a while, staff capacity has limited that. Um, as we all know, the police department is well under staff right now and our police chief and our lieutenant are um, doing shifts on the street and not even being able to do uh, some of the administrative work. So that is a goal to get back to that, but it is not reasonable at this time. Um, I think that we will get there once we get uh, folks in and trained up. Um, that said, we probably um, can talk to them about getting a year end report just with the simple statistics of what calls we had and what types of calls there were. Um, that really was the base level reporting uh, that we previously had um, on a 
I think it was every other month to quarterly basis. Yeah, that'd be great if that's available at some point. Um, I'm sure everyone would be interested in reading that. Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Naplin. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that it doesn't have to be any type of a fancy report and it, it would be great if it was, uh, you know, maybe as part of the administrative um, update during an actual council meeting so the community could be um, included in hearing, you know, just a very, very brief update um, periodically. So um, they might be slightly two separate things, a more formal report and a, possibly an informal uh, report to the community. <clears throat> Okay, is there anything else for the good of the order? Okay, then uh, let's see, oh, Kevin's on. Did you wanna go ahead and kick off the review of the regular meeting agenda? All right, just need to unmute. So if you've looked at the, the council meeting, don't have a lot of uh, uh, Information, you know, there's not a lot of things that are going to be really unusual about it or that we really have to make sure we get done because of uh, timing, but there's a few things. Um, we have nothing on consent, I believe, aside from, you know, the standard things, we have nothing, no, no uh, um, ordinances or not ordinances, but resolutions we have asked for consent that we would think that f fits in our consent. Um, I don't think we have anybody who is going to be commenting to the audience. Uh, we do have a our routine fire district 45 report. And I see Chief Airskin is here. Um, we do have four public hearings, and they they have been postponed a number of times because of uh, not posting them, and then we didn't have a quorum, and so we really need to get through these four public hearings and need to get those those things identified. I know it's not sometimes people don't feel comfortable with voting when. It is something that we just had a public hearing about, but they keep getting pushed off. So they should have probably been done back in December at the latest. And so I, I would ask you if you feel comfortable with them, they've been up there a few times and people have been able to look at them to feel comfortable. We can we can vote on them. There's nothing against the rules. Voting on the same day as a public hearing, as long as the public hearing is already completed. Uh, new business, we have the council selection of Mayor Pro Tem, which I think everybody is understands that then we have the process for appointment of council member to vacant position four that's where we're going to have to really talk about what process and we'll talk about um, what the timeline is uh, so we'll need some direction and some uh, what the process needs to be decided at this meeting i really think because uh, we're running out of time now uh, acceptance of king county community development block grant uh, that one those there'll be a uh, fairly uh, uh, there'll be a little discussion and we'd like to get that passed tonight um, because we're just accepting the CDBG money that we've asked for. Um, there's some unfinished business resolution for the capital improvement program, the general facilities charge, uh, the garbage collection, which is an ordinance and that should have been on the December 18th meeting. But what, as we, we had that special meeting only two days later because of the quorum, I think we dropped it. But that's the one, if you remember, it just takes the ordinance and makes the ordinance fit the contract that has been approved and signed. So it's really not a hard one, but it's an ordinance, so it can't go on consent. Uh, resolution approving the comprehensive plan docket. We heard the public hearing last meeting. And so this is the next, um, the next step is to do the decision. And then resolution adopting the 2022 consolidated fee schedule. And that's the one that Dana's spoken a few times about where we're trying to take things out of code create a resolution that every year we can update to make sure that it fits current uh, current fees. And that's it, there's not really, there's a few things we'd really like to get done, but there's nothing really that we're asking for consent at this point. Um, but there will be a lot of discussion, I think, about the appointment process. And that's, uh, that's I think, gonna be the biggest time constraint. That's it, unless anybody has questions. And it doesn't really look like there are, so great. Um, with that, before I move on really quick, I just want to say, because I forgot to, just welcome to John Isaacson. Uh, I know you're not officially sworn in yet, but we're excited to have you here. So, and with that also, let's see, Alyssa's on here, correct? Yes. So um, our first item on our agenda is the overview of the Snoqualmie Watershed Forum with Alyssa Ostergaard, the Salmon Recovery Manager in King County. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um... I'm going to try to share my screen and see how this goes. Always challenging. OK. 
Okay, how does that look? Perfect. Great. Okay, great. Well, I want to say greetings and thank you for having me. My name is Alyssa Ostergaard. I'm the Salmon Recovery Manager for the Snoqualmie and South Fork Skykomish watersheds, basically the King County portion of the Snohomish Basin. The um, last time I had the opportunity to present to this group was in February of 2018, so there's quite a few new faces now. And I wanted to just give you an overview of this uh, committee that Duval is a part of and um, talk about what the group does, the benefits to Duval, um, the payments that you make for it and um, how this is helping with watershed improvements across the basin. Let's see. Um, oh, one more thing I just wanted to mention that the um, Snoqualmie Watershed Forum operates, has been in existence since 1998, and it operates under an interlocal agreement between all of these parties on um, this screen at, with King County as the service provider. The uh, group formed because they saw the writing on the wall in the mid 1990s that Chinook and other salmon were going to be listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And so being the Washington way, rather than having the federal government tell the local people what to do, the, the groups decided to do their own science and make their own locally based plans about actions they wanted to take to improve habitat to recover salmon. So Chinook and bull trout were listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1999, and that was followed by um, steelhead being listed in 2007. So the 14 watersheds around Puget Sound developed salmon recovery plans like this one you see on the left here that was uh, approved in June of 2005 for the Snohomish Basin by the local group. And that plan was then adopted uh, with the other four, 13 uh, chapters as part of the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Plan by, by NOAA, or National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the federal agency. So the, the governance for salmon recovery in the basin, it's a little uh, unique because there are actually two forums, the Snohomish Basin, Salmon Recovery Forum or is organized, is responsible for salmon recovery for the entire Raya 7 watershed, which includes the Snoqualmie and Skykomish rivers that both come together in Snohomish County and then flow, uh, turn into the Snohomish River and flow out into Puget Sound via Everett. The, that's also known as the Snohomish Basin or Raya 7. And Snohomish County is responsible for updating the salmon recovery plan for the whole basin, running uh, state run grant rounds for a couple of different uh, funding sources called Salmon Recovery Funding Board and Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration. And they also have to do the monitoring and reporting to the state and federal governments about the status of salmon recovery. For the group that you're involved with that I lead, the Snoqualmie Watershed Forum, we, are, we oversee the implementation of that salmon recovery plan just in the King County portion of the basin, which includes the, most of the Snoqualmie and a good portion of the South Fork Skykomish uh, basins. And what we do is with the with the help of the uh, funding from the interlocal agreement, the, we run this committee called the Salmon, the Snoqualmie Watershed Forum with currently 13 members, but uh, approved up to 15 members. It includes those eight jurisdictions and tribes that I mentioned at the beginning that are parties to the interlocal agreement, plus three citizens, one nonprofit representative, um, plus a member from the King Conservation District. 
the forum committee meets six times a year and the funding that's contributed supports 2.7 staff. So the four of us that you see on the screen, um, myself as the manager, Corey Zyla, the project coordinator, Emily Davis, the technical coordinator at halftime and Carla Nielsen, the administrative coordinator at 20% time. The, um, the cost shares paid, you can see here in the table or um, support a budget of almost $600,000 a year. And that is also supplemented by about $2 million that's contributed by the King County Flood Control District that the forum makes the decisions about how to give out those grant funds for habitat restoration, uh, monitoring projects and education projects that also funds a uh, grant to help with the staffing that helps offset the costs for the cities because um, of the population differential between King County. Otherwise, they'd be paying a much larger share per person than the other uh, RIAs in King County, which are structured in a very similar way. So what does the group do? So the actions that we take are based on that science that I mentioned, that's the basis of the salmon recovery plan. And our goals are to recover Chinook and other salmonids, which right now their numbers are still at less than 6% of the population target that was set in 2005 for a lot of reasons. Um, so, so we've done a lot of work to protect uh, and restore streams and rivers and habitat along them. We've planted a lot of plant, native plants and removed a lot of invasive weeds and removed over two miles of levee um, and we're set it back. And we, where we focus based on the science is uh, in the areas near where Chinook are spawning, where there's gravel in the river. That's what they found with the science was that what's missing is the rearing habitat or the habitat for the baby fish right after they hatch out from the gravel. They need these really shallow um, gravelly bars and areas with a lot of wood and diversity to find rest, uh, shelter, and food. And if they don't have that, if the water is just going down between levees and going really fast, they have a very hard time surviving and there's not as much area. So we have focus in the Snoqualmie River below Snoqualmie Falls and also the Tolt River, Raging River and South Fork Skykomish because those are the most productive areas. Above Snoqualmie Falls, we basically focus on trying to maintain hydrology and water quality. So that in large part includes protecting forest cover and restoring wetlands, lakes and streams. So this map just shows the distribution of habitat improvements across the basin. And one of the benefits to Duval of participating is that you get the benefit of being involved in the science and the decision-making about where these habitat projects are implemented. We also um, have a lot more bang for our buck working together. And the money that we distribute with Cooperative Watershed Management grants is leveraged uh, quite a lot. As this slide shows, um, since 1998, there's been over $40 million leveraged with these local funds. And um, you can see we're not quite meeting our goal most years of $10 million, although we did in 2021, we got over $15 million in 2021, in part because of a couple of large grants from the floodplains by design uh, grant program which is a statewide program for the fall city floodplain restoration project which is going to be they're going to start construction this coming summer and it's a really exciting project with um, levee setbacks on both sides of the river just downstream of fall city with um, side channels being created, um, farmlands protected, a road road moved away from the river to prevent it again from getting flood damage over and over again and some other benefits.
So the other benefits include, um, we have since we have the staff team, we do like to provide uh, your staff with support for identifying habitat projects with technical assistance for developing funding strategies for those projects and helping with grant writing. And um, to, to date, Duval has uh, been awarded over $600,000 for uh, salmon related and watershed related grants since 1998. So looking forward the next couple of years, we plan to just continue strong. We're gonna continue supporting our partners to put our projects in the best places and develop good funding strategies for them. We are seeing a lot of new funding coming in from federal and state and local programs for these multi-benefit projects where there are benefits for fish, also for flood risk reduction, for farmers and for recreation. So we'll be moving more and more towards trying to do those types of projects. Also, there's more funding becoming available for removing fish barriers like culverts along streams. So that's very promising. We continue to have policy discussions about natural resource, natural resource policies to create a favorable, envir favorable environment for habitat restoration and protection. And of course, we're always uh, facing a lot of challenges with all of the population growth, with climate change, and we just can have to continue to uh, work to maintain public support and political will for investing in these projects that we've already invested so much in. So with that, I am happy to stop sharing and um, have a conversation or answer any questions anybody may have. Go ahead, Council Member Schaefer. Okay, uh, not really <clears throat> a question, Alyssa. Uh, you and I were able to uh, meet last month and talk a bit. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate how excited I am about being part of the uh, Watershed Forum. I'm really, really looking forward to that. <clears throat> as a uh, fisherman, as an environmentalist, uh, and uh, somebody that cares deeply uh, about salmon and other, uh, other fish, uh, uh, this is just going to be a great experience uh, for me. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> like I say, I'm, I'm looking forward to that a lot. I think I, you, you touched on these, but a couple of really important points. First of all, this is a science-based program. These projects are not done hit and miss. Uh, uh, I think the uh, projects are looked at very carefully to make sure we get the biggest bang for our uh, for our bucks. And uh, uh, because of that, I think it's you know, it will be uh, successful. Uh, the other thing is this, this obviously benefits the salmon, but just as importantly, uh, it benefits the whole ecosystem, uh, not just uh, for salmon, but benefits many, many different species, not the least of which is us humans uh, that live in this area as, as well. Um, it is, it, it, you know, it is and will continue to be uh, a benefit for us, make this a better place to live. Uh, it, obviously has the uh, support of the local native tribes who feel, feel a very strong connection uh, to the land. Uh, because of all this, uh, I anticipate uh, continued success uh, of the program. So more of a sales pitch than, than a question, I guess, but thanks, Alyssa. Thank you, I appreciate that. Go ahead, Council Member Langell. You're muted. Okay, um, something that uh, I, we've talked about a bit here in Duval is the erosion of one of our banks that goes into the river. And um, I don't, I've been trying to understand how the forum um, interacts with that. I think I remember that we got a grant to look at that, but it's really, really a big project. We know it's complicated. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that intersect between uh, what you all are doing and a you know very specific problem that is actually in one of our parks. So it, it does have that issue of connecting to recreation opportunities. And um, actually, I think, you know, arts events and um, just tourism in general. 
Yeah, um, thanks for mentioning that. I think you're talking about that bank in McCormick Park that's um, that's eroding. Yeah, um, the I think that might be an issue that you know it's definitely related to salmon, but it's a, a bank protection project is not the type of project that can necessarily get funded with habitat restoration because okay. it is actually kind of counter to what salmon really need. Um, there can be some structural things that could be done to like adding large wood to rivers. Um, we always recommend planting the banks because those, you know, if those trees can get large enough, they, those roots can really protect the banks from erosion. But, um, you know, moving back and forth is something that rivers do. And it is a very difficult thing when we have property boundaries that don't necessarily always move with the river and we have, um, you know, land uses. So it, it might be sort of a longer term uh, look at the landscape and what could be done to maybe add some other areas to the park or, you know, just think about some longer term solutions. But we do um, provide a lot of assistance to your staff about, you know, the type of projects that can be funded through cooperative watershed management grant funds. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, Council member Naplin. Yeah, I actually had the same question. So thank you, uh, council member Langle for asking it. Um, just out of curiosity, um, I don't know if, uh, your group, any of your experts have had a chance to look at kind of the idea that was put forth. I think there were three different ideas of how to approach the bank stabilization. I think the one that, that uh, our public works department was sort of leaning towards had, you know, some restoration aspects to it. And so I'd be curious if, you know, if we're looking towards, you know, salmon habitat and, and trying to make a salmon friendly river, if that's something that your group could take a look at and let us know if there are aspects that could be, um, you know, tweaked to make sure we were optimizing what we were doing. I don't know if that's something that you've Certainly. already Certainly. Yeah, we would absolutely be willing to help out with that. Yeah. And then also, you know, if there would be, if there was an aspect that we could add on, if there would be, um, you know, funding or grant potential. Mm -hmm. I know we're working with I think King County Parks has a shoreline type uh, grant that they have put forth, but it's only 50%. And once again, this is, as Councilmember Langle said, it's a, a pretty large project. Um, yeah. Anyway, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, there, yeah, we can definitely look at some funding strategies for that too, because there might be like some King County Flood Control District opportunity funds or something like that that we could be eligible for too. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments for Alyssa? All right, not seeing any. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That's a great presentation as always and um, really informative. So I'm sure you probably have to get going, but of course you're welcome to stay if you'd like. So have a good evening. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you so much again for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm very delighted to have council member Schaefer and council member Hogue um, on the forum this year. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. All right, so our next agenda item is um, talking about the uh, council retreat that normally is in January, but given our circumstances with the vacancy, we're thinking that, you know, February would be more appropriate. Um, Kevin, do, are you, you're fine if I just take the wheel here, or I know your name is under this, but did you have anything to say about the retreat, or I'm just good to go? No, I, I just, you know, in, it's 6.2 of our current uh, uh, procedures. It does talk about the council retreats. You know, the first quarter yearly retreat and what it what it entails. I think everybody knows that. And then I think you've got everything else. We talked about things that essentially we've talked about things uh, with the mayor pro tem that have come up over the last few months that may be good potential um, fodder for a retreat. And that's it's up to you, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Hold on, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. So I didn't send this out. I just wanted to talk about everything here. These are some of the things we spoke about at our meeting, um, Kevin and I and the mayor. And 
Um, so again, I'm just noting at the top there that the timing could probably be mid to late February, just being realistic. I'm not sure what the timing will be of where everyone's schedules line up um, to be available. So there were some things I've kind of bumped apart here. So there's the potential for having a training, call it a retreat maybe, but something separate from the actual retreat that we're about to talk about. And so I started a list there. You know, we've talked about for so long about um, Anne McFarland and Robert's Rules of Orders training. And I think we've all said that we really would like to get into that more and, and become more efficient with that. And it could be a great training, but that would probably be I'm thinking maybe March or later, depending on how that can get scheduled. And I've heard that the Planning Commission is also interested in being involved in that as well. We've talked about OPMA training, um, so social media training. I bumped down here as well because that's also a part of our procedures that we're working through. So if we're going to do social media training, maybe it would make sense until after we've solidified what our procedures will be going forward. So now kind of jumping back up to where we should have started, I suppose, is potential agenda items for this retreat. Um, I, in my mind, one of the biggest ones would be our council procedures because we're getting so close on those. And there are those two big sections that you know, we tried to come up with some interim rules, but um, obviously we have a lot of ideas and opinions. So it just seemed like that those were good sections to do as a whole council. Is that something you guys want to do at the retreat? Um, it seems like it would probably take more time than a cow would provide. So it might make sense. So, and then I added onto this something that Kevin had brought up, which was, and to me, it's really linked closely to council procedures you know, to give council, it could be a written report or a presentation would be fine of the staff process for bringing agenda bills and presentations forward to council. And then we could have a discussion around, you know, on our end in our council procedures, are there things we can do to help that process to be more efficient with it? So I see those as closely linked and maybe we could squeeze that in if we do take that on at the time. Now, of course, committee assignments is a big one. And so what I would say today, um, or, you know, assuming if I do continue on in the mayor pro tem role that, you know, if anyone is thinking about specific committees and what they want to be on in 2022 after this retreat, to start thinking of it now and at least reaching out and saying, hey, I, I'm interested in these committees so I can kind of tally where we're at. Um, there's also a re-examination of what role the city should play in engaging with the DFA or other cultural and arts organizations. I really appreciated uh, Kevin bringing this one up. I think that's you know, behind the scenes on a lot of things lately. And I think it would be a good conversation to have. If it doesn't fit here, maybe it fits in the next retreat, I'm not sure. Um, also discussion of options for the remaining biennium positions. And then I think lastly, my more overarching question to you all would be in the past, we've had some kind of facilitator or speaker for the first part. Um, and so I don't know if that's something we'd wanna have our city attorney there to just ask questions. We haven't had a session like that in a while. That might help prep him for future training sessions that he could help us with. Um, so I know I threw a lot out there. I'll probably stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again because it's so difficult. So sorry, I did not send this out because it's such a rough thing, but I just wanted to start the conversation. So I don't know, do you guys have thoughts, opinions on, do you think the council procedures would be one of the best things to take on for a bulk of the retreat? Go ahead, council member Langle. <laughs> well, you and I had sort of started noodling along with this um, a little while ago, and I do think that should be our primary focus, um, so I'll say that. Um, on your last item, which had to do with the city attorney participating a little bit, and uh, one of the things that I tend to, uh, it, when I contact the city attorney, usually it's because I'm trying to better understand an appropriate way to bring forward a motion or an amendment. Now, I, I know the technicality of that, but I think that's an area that at least I would really benefit more as, you know, maybe him coming and having, we have, you know, he has some examples of how, you know, you can do it this way, you can do it that way. It's not always a cut and dried thing, but um, I really would like to learn how to do that better, I guess. Um, and specifically to, to make motions. And motions can be a variety of things, I guess, on an agenda. Um, so that is one thing I would really appreciate if in a city attorney presentation. And then the last thing I would address is um, DFA and arts organizations. 
and um, there has been so much time spent uh, on um, at least the DFA piece that I guess in my order of uh, priority, it would be further down the list. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that um, what I had in mind for the city attorney part was maybe, I don't know, something shorter toward the beginning of the retreat, but I know it could bleed into, I don't want to just keep them there the whole time as we're working through procedures or anything, but I think I'm understanding you're talking about how to bring up motions. I'm just wondering if that would be solved with the Robert's Rules of Order training later, which hopefully we could do sooner rather than later in the year. Um, but, you know, we could talk about that more. Did anyone else have any ideas or go ahead, Council Member Hogue. Well, I, I just am thrilled that you're um, wanting to bring forward the procedures. I, I think that it, we're so close to having it done. I think that would be great. Um, maybe if we did a retreat based on that, one thought is I think the attorney could help us with social media because um, that's something we're going to be talking about at some point is uh, social media, whether we would want to consider an ombudsman. And I think that gets into a lot of legalities right now with, um, with what's going on in some other cities. So maybe that would be something that the attorney might be helpful uh, to have for that portion of it as an idea. Um, DFA, I think, is something that, to me, that is a, a priority to be working with the arts. Um, I was brainstorming with Director Thomas and Director Oppel, and um, one thought is that um, if we had a staff member that was kind of um, the go-to person that the arts could go to, could, could, you know, communicate with primarily, and then maybe we had some council members or at least one council member that was kind of the primary person that they could contact. I don't know, like a, like kind of a liaison. It was just an idea. I think we need to be um, figuring out ways to work with the arts and just some ideas. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, that last piece that you said made me think of those council or committee assignments and um, you know, right now we're pretty focused on committees, but yeah, what about liaisons for different, you know, items like that too? That could be really important to talk about, and that might fit into that piece of it. Um, I love your idea about uh, if the city attorney could talk to us about what currently is going on in our area with social media policies and what maybe some best practices he's seen. Um, that could be really great to start off and then um, we could go from there. I don't know how the whole council will feel. Um, I know there are the two sections we've identified that we want the whole council to go through. Obviously they'll read through everything, but I think social media is also one of those because I just don't know that three people could <laughs> come up with something that seven would agree to. So that would be really good to talk about. Anyone else? Uh, council Member Naplin. Yeah, I agree. The social media thing, uh, it, it would be helpful to have an attorney there. Um, just kind of contemplating if that ends up being on the agenda uh, for our retreat, which I, I agree with. Is there any way ahead of the meeting we could get samples of other cities' policies? I'm assuming you guys have been working with that, but that always helps me kind of uh, frame, well, what's working or maybe not working in other cities as, as I review um, what's being proposed for our city. But I, I think that is an excellent idea i'd love to get that that finished and i know you all have worked really hard on it <laughs> yeah we mayor i see you one second i just wanted to say we have just started at the surface of social media just talking about bigger principles around it we have not gotten quite to that level yet um for me personally i would really like to hear i think daniel could point us in some really good directions of cities to look at um but yeah maybe i, I it depends timing wise i think hopefully we'd have enough time to maybe reach out to some other cities and hear pros and cons of, you know, being allowed to use social media or not, or, you know, I think there's a lot out there and everyone's doing it a little differently. So go ahead, Mayor. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, especially since we have a new council member, uh, council member Isaacson, um, if we can have the clerk send out the existing social media policy, council social media policy that was approved in, I think, 2015 or 16, 
Um, there is a policy that all council members get when they're elected. Um, and now, now that the discussion is happening, it's a good opportunity to resend it um, and remind people of the uh, current policy that is in place. Um, and then, you know, we also have the internal uh, city policy that will need to be updated as well. So um, just want to throw that out there and uh, remind folks of that. Great. Did anyone else have anything or, I mean, does everyone feel pretty good about focusing on procedures and maybe, I mean, the other part was, you know, I think it'd be a lot because if we do a full day one versus half day, there are some other logistical things I'm sure Sarah can help us organize in terms of date, time, full day, half day. I'm assuming everyone would like to stay in town to save costs and just for ease of transport and stuff, but um, I'm sure that's stuff we can figure out later. But um, in terms of what we all talked about, does ever, anyone who didn't comment, does that sound pretty good? No strong objections? Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Naplin. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing it, that we've done, it seems like at most retreats is just kind of go over the work plan of, you know, mm -hmm. some of the issues we want to tackle over the next year. I think starting out, you know, at the beginning of the year talking about what committees and then if there's any uh, special things we want to tackle as, as, a, as a council. Yeah, and I might have to reach out to uh, the previous mayor pro tem and see where we are since we're on that uh, bi mid biennium budget now, um, or the two years trying to figure out where we are there for our priorities versus in the next year and see if we need to shift or if we still wanna stay on the same track we are. Um, so yeah, that's a good good idea. I did wanna ask, cause one thing Mike said as he was uh, leaving was suggesting maybe a facilitator, meaning somebody to work with two groups um, through difficult times. I know some times are better than others. Um, they kind of goes up and down, but I know a lot of other places, you know, King County and every other jurisdiction you can think of pretty frequently can bring people in to help work through some conflicts. So I don't know if that is something we have time to delve into and do in this retreat, or if we want to think in the next retreat um, to maybe look at that. Does anyone have strong feelings of sooner rather than later, or do you think it'd be okay to wait till the next retreat? Councilmember Lingle. You're muted. Councilmember, you're muted. Uh, um, I, I think it would be too much to commingle because the procedures is so important. So I would say that's, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important. I just think that timing wise, um, it might be too much for the same retreat. Yeah, so I think what we'd be looking at then potentially if everyone is in agreement with it would be that this retreat would focus on getting those procedures wrapped up. Um, that would be such a huge accomplishment <laughs> to finish this year uh, along with the social media component. Um, and then it sounds like we could have a separate training opportunity um, along with planning commission for OPMA and uh, Robert's rules of orders. And then I think, um, Mayor, maybe you're, I, I don't know who the best person to ask is, is our second retreat usually in July or is it later in the year? I'm trying to remember. Uh, usually June at yeah. the latest, July. Um, and, but that said, you know, I think that, um, you know, staff will be starting working on uh, budgeting priorities within the next couple of months. So I think it would be helpful, um, well, our priorities were set by the biennial budget and the changes to the mid-biennium budget, that it would be a good, um, a good opportunity um, to do those high level, um, high level goals and things that you want to see in the next budget mm -hmm. um, so that we can consider them as we, and balance them with our priorities as we uh, put together that next draft budget. Yeah, that sounds great. As but as far as a mid a mid year retreat, um, you know, ideally the budget council will set some high level priorities before that time. Um, I would actually suggest, especially with a new group, um, even before then, an entire day of team building uh, with a facilitator as well as activities because when it's safe, because we have not been able to get together as a group for two years, and I think that's critically important for um, our relationships and our ability to collaborate in the long term. Yeah, I agree. Did anyone else have? Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Schaefer. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I'm in full agreement with what uh, you know what we talked about with the uh, uh, 
for, you know, for the next uh, session, but uh, I would like to keep, uh, keep you know, having some kind of a vision in mind for us, you know, a long-term vision. You know, we talked about uh, a previous vision that had like a 10-year time frame. I think that's very important for us as the council to have some type of agreement in our minds of what we want to all to be in 10 years. You know, do we still want it to be small? If, if, you know, what does small even mean? Uh, and, uh, you, know, what we, you know, what not only growth means to us, but uh, other types of uh, technology and trends that are impacting us as a uh, uh, outlying community right now. So maybe the, the uh, you know, next team building session that we, you know, if not, uh, if not this one, the, uh, said June, the June one, perhaps. Yeah, but I think, you know, and going off of what the mayor said too, I, I think we could squeeze in at least some part uh, at the beginning, you know, start with our priorities, where are we at with those, where do we go from here, are we making any changes, tweaks, but then that bigger vision is really important, so what a better way to start off a retreat than by retouching on that and looking at that again, go through our priorities so that that way it's available to the mayor in a timely manner for as they start prepping the new budget. Um, and then, yeah, if we had Daniel there for talking about, in general, social media policies in different cities, and then that would kind of lead us into then the rest of the retreat, we can just hammer through those procedures. Oh, and we can talk about committee assignments too. That's the other key one. So sounds like, I feel like it'll be a little more than half a day if you guys are good with a full day retreat. <laughs> but um, I think this is really important to get all of this done. Great. All right, are we good on that? Does everyone feel pretty okay with everything that's been talked about? Yeah? All right, so we can move on then to our agenda night, uh, number three, which is options for utility shutoffs. And I'll hand it over to our Director of Finance, Dana Mason. Or good evening. <laughs> Mayor and Council, Dana Mason, Director of Finance. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> can everyone see that okay? Okay, excellent. So at a meeting in November, a council member mentioned that a resident had spoken to them about confusion uh, regarding past due and pending disconnection notifications. Um, so I just want to walk you through this is just a snapshot of a typical billing cycle. Meters are read around the 23rd and sent out the following day. So in November, the October to 23rd, a 23rd to November 23rd water usage bills were mailed on the 24th. And then those bills are due the 20th of the next month. So those bills for, were due on December 20th. Um, and then, or, or the next business day if the 20th falls on a weekend. A past due notice with um, a 10% late fee is sent out five business days after the 20th. So that was on the 27th. Well, actually on the 27th of December, the late fee is incurred. And then on the 28th, the past due is mailed out. And then if the bill isn't paid by the 14th of the next month, a pending disconnection notice is sent along with another $20 fee. And so the, uh, the pending disconnection notices for this the October 23rd to November 23rd water usage will be mailed on the 17th of January. And then um, five days later or five business days later, the water is shut off if it's, it's not paid. So it's not posted. So you can see that during this time, um, when a late fee is incurred, when that notifica notification is sent out, another bill is already being sent out. And then when the pending disconnection notice is mailed in between that time and when the water shutoff is, notice is posted, an additional a bill is sent out. So I think that's where some of the confusion comes through. So, um, and then in addition, uh, the past due notification and the pending uh, disconnection notifications don't have the current balance on the, the, the invoices or the statements. So some, some customers have said that when they, they pay their past due, they think they're paying their entire bill and, um, and really what they're doing is just paying the current bill or the, the, the past due amount and not the current bills that are owed. 
Um, and then also pending disconnections can be delayed in the mail. And so we, we send them out and then they have five days notice. So if it's delayed, that really shortens the window of, of when their water will be shut off. So uh, staff recommendations, we're, we're hoping that um, we have a, a email out to OpenGov to see if our new financial software will print the current balance and the past due balance on past due and they do late feed notifications and penny disconnection notifications. And then we're also um, recommending that we extend just because of the, 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 the mail in Duval is delayed sometimes, send um, extend or amend code to extend the five days to 10 days for shutoffs. So that is all I have. It's just open for discussion at this point in time. In your packet is the, um, the code that would be amended and some recommended um, amendments at this point in time. But um, really this is just open for discussion and direction from council. Council would like to move forward with us. Council Member Hogue, did you have your hand up? I did. So I noticed in the packet that there was a sample of a shutoff notice and it was dated, you know, it was dated 2019, I think. So is that a, the old way of doing your shutoff notices or is that a suggested new way? That, that's a really good question. That, that notice is actually the one that goes on the door when your water is being shut off. And so that, that is the current notice that goes on the door. Because I thought it was pretty self-explanatory. It looked like there is a dollar amount of the current bill too on there. Like if you want to pay your bill in full, this is what you pay. But maybe it's too far down the <laughs> page or I don't know. I thought it was a pretty good notice. I, I think some of the confusion is when the, when the ones that are mailed to them, not the ones that are put on the door, because uh, those ones don't have, yeah. So the pen, first you get a late fee note, a past due notification, and that just has the amount that's due. And then you get a pending disconnection notification mailed to you, and that just has the past amount due. And then you get the notification on the door, and that has everything on it. So that's very, very clear, but some people I just, you know, it's just confusing to them. So it's the one in the mail that should have, uh, yeah, have something in there so they know that this is not their final bill, right? Or, the current. Right. or yeah. that there's still a current balance due. And by, by the time they get the penny disconnection notice, they have two other months that they, you know, they're, they're behind three months, really. Um, unless they've paid their, their current balances and, and not their past due balances. So we can also get a stamp and stamp on the notices that are going out. Hey, this does not include your current balance. It would take a lot of staff time to write that amount in. But since we're going over to a new financial software and we're hoping that those notifications will kind of clear up the confusion because they'll have both the past due and the current balance um, we would just need to use that for a little while. Thank you. Council Member Naplin, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Council Member Hogue that it looks like the door notice does make it clear, but the problem is by the time you get the door notice, your water is shut off. <laughs> yeah. So, right, it's now it's clear and it's too late and you owe fees and have to get your water turned back on and you've been just you know, it's, it's highly inconvenient. It's a waste of staff time. And, you know, so yes, that notice looks very clear, but it's too bad that type of notice couldn't mm -hmm. um, have showed up earlier. I, I think the other thing that would, I need clarifying is sometimes I don't check the mail every day. Well, I'll be honest, I don't ever do that. So I get the mail, let's say, and both my notices are in there. There's the past new due notice, and now I get my new next month's bill, and I get them at the same time. And will my new month's bill show the past due amount and the current amount? 
That's actually a really good question. I didn't ask Stephanie that. I'll find out. I'll find out for you. I believe it does, but I am not 100% sure. I think it's just the past few notifications that don't have both amounts, but I'll find out for you. I think that would really make things clear is if, yes, maybe the past new do past due notice comes out and gets sent about five days before the next bill comes out. That needs to be very clear that this is a past due notice and that it says, you know, this doesn't necessarily, this doesn't include your next month that you're going to get a bill for soon. And then to not have the shutoff happen until at least the, the bill, the new bill that comes out on the 20th has been sent out and had time to be received. And that bill could show past due and the current amount due um, so that if there's like a timing of which one you opened, it would be very clear the situation. I don't know. I agree that they need extra days. Having the shutoff happen basically kind of around the same time as they're getting a new bill, it's very confusing. And <laughs> we, we could amend the code to um, just extend that time just so you when you get the, the notice in the, the mail, it's not two days later, it's, you know, it's just a, a little bit further down the road. And then hopefully with um, OpenGov, we'll be able to have rectified, you know, the, the notifications that go out without the current balance and just the past due balances. So could um, you find out if the new bill? I, I will, I'll find out and I'll, I'll email all of council and let you know. Because I, I remember I did have an interaction with someone who got their water shut off and it was extremely confusing. And she showed me kind of what she'd received. And I was like, yeah, I would have been confused too. <laughs> Any other questions on this for Director Mason? So it sounds like there's direction for me to move forward with changing the five days to the 10 days. And then I'll find out about the... Um, about the current bill if it includes the past due amounts as well and then we'll we'll get that stamp and we'll just at least stamp until we come out with our new financial software yeah i think that sounds really reasonable um and given the time did you say what's our guess best guess for the time until open gov till the new system will kick in uh, we're hoping to go live in march okay so it's it's not very much time at all so yeah it sounds pretty like a good way to bridge between the two. Okay. All right, so with that then, I guess we'll move on to our next one also with uh, Director Mason for code changes concerning responsible party for utility billing. So this one has actually been on our uh, uh, utility billing clerks list for quite some time. So um, current D DMC uh, allows for utility billing in a tenant's name rather than the property owner's name. The city has 155 tenant accounts and it tenants rent for an average of 2.5 years. So uh, when a tenant vacates the property, a significant amount of staff time is spent acting as a go-between between, between the property owner and the renter, final bills, where to send the final bill, when the final bill is, is paid, and then setting up the new account. And then a new account can't be set up until the owner fills out a request to bill tenant form. And so there's a delay there. So it's just, it's, it's, uh, it causes a lot of frustration and it takes up a lot of um, staff time. And then the average tenant receives past uh, five past due notices. So if the property owner were responsible for billing, we think this, the past due notice amount, uh, the number of past due notices would decrease. So staff is um, asking council to consider amending DNC to prohibit the billing of residential tenants. Um, we could allow property owners the option of having a duplicate bill sent to the, the, resi the residents for a nominal fee. Many cities do this. Um, bills in the name of co commercial tenants could still be allowed. Residential tenants could still be eligible for the low income rate reductions, and then the change could start with new tenants and then just take one or two years to change over existing accounts um, just to you know, ease property owners into the change. So 
this open for discussion to see if council has any feedback or if council's open open to this um, idea or the change to code. Uh, council Are member Oh, sorry, council member Schaefer and then Langle. Okay, th th thank you, Director. So the, uh, just, just so I make sure I understand, even if duplicate bills are sent, one to the property owner and one to the tenant, the, the property owner would still be responsible for the payment, is that correct? They, they would be, and ultimately they really mm -hmm. are because the city could put a lien on the property. property. Um, so if, if some, some cities do offer this service, so the, pro the tenant can see that the, uh, property owner is not overcharging them for utilities or or they just pay it when they get the bill and but the property owner is still still responsible so it just be instead of being sent to you know mark smith who rented the property it would just be sent to resident right right okay good. Uh, second question the uh, your last sentence, the change could start with new tenants and take one to two years to change over existing tenants. Uh, I, I assume that even if a uh, the same tenant is there after the one or two years, we would still change that over to the new way of billing. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we would just give property owners a heads up that this is coming down the pike and maybe give them a year to to we could slowly change them over within the next two years just do a or or we could say hey, we're going to do them all at this point in time yeah but we, we would want to give them a heads up so they they know it's happening great yes yes and and they uh, may have leases with their tenants um that would need to be updated and changed sure yeah it's a little shocking that you know that the average tenant receives five overdue notices yeah. I have and, no and, idea. And that, that is average some receive average, zero yeah. and some receive 62 so it's yeah. it's a pretty big range anyway i like this idea i think it makes things simpler and hopefully less expensive for the city okay. council member lingle and then naplin i was just going to say that i support the staff recommendation as point one number two um one of the things I think that happens between landlords and tenants is um, that can be a problem is um, landlords don't pay the bill for some reason. But um, because of the uh, statutory authority to lien their property, I think that's uh, less likely. I also think a lot of tenants just assume their utilities are part of their rent. So that's another reason I support the staff recommendation. I think it will improve um, our collection problem. Council Member Neplin. Yeah, this just reminded me of um, something I should have brought up during the last uh, topic. And it's some of the cities I've seen when I did my research, um, they provide a door hanger 48 hours before shut off. And so you would have a fee mm -hmm for putting the hanger. And I, it was reminded me about how clear that door hanger was that council member Hogue was noticing. And perhaps if that notice could be delivered 48 hours before the shutoff, in addition to the mailing, um, and the one city I saw, and maybe the other one did too, there was a fee, there was like a $15 fee if you got the 48 hour notice of shutoff door hanger, um, that it would prevent a lot of actual shutoffs if they mm -hmm. if that and, and we would charge a fee for it because if you think about it when we actually do shut off the water it requires two visits you got to put the door hanger on and then you got to come and turn it back on <laughs> so it's a minimum of two and perhaps we could eliminate the actual shutting off of the water if we just put a door hanger on 48 hours in advance I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. And I, I'm looking at the tenant thing. I mean, sometimes you have multiple people living at some place who's checking the mail. You know, they might not get the notice because they aren't very good at checking mail. A lot of people pay bills online. You know, I mean, they aren't checking their mail. So perhaps if we charge a fee to put something on the door, someone's going to see that and be like, oh, crap, my water's going to get shut off. And we could eliminate 
a lot of the work of public works physically having to turn the water off and then turn it back on again. I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. And it's definitely something that other cities do. They, they give a 48 hours door hanger. Yeah. So um, actually we, we do this for the city of Kirkland does that, for example, mm -hmm. instead of pending disconnection notices, they do door hangers, but they, we, we thought about that because there would be 80 pending there, you know, we average about 80 and that would take a lot of public works staff time. So I don't know at this point in time, if we, Steve kind of ran the numbers just to see if it would be feasible. Um, and it, it, or Director Lenischewski, sorry, um, ran the numbers to see if it would be feasible. So it, <clears throat> it would take a significant amount of time, but it's definitely something that is a deterrent, getting that notice first on hanging on your door. Excuse so, me. I guess I, I, I might be, you might be misunderstanding this suggestion. So I'm not saying the 10 days prior for every single person that's late, you go put a door hanger on. I'm saying you send out 10 days ahead and say, you have until this date to pay. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're gonna get a fee and we're gonna put something on your door. You know what I mean? So, so the only, additional fee. So at the, maybe you give them eight, you know, I, at some point, the only people you put the door thing on are the people who've ignored the in the mail late notice mm -hmm. and are, does that make sense? Because I agree, Any every single person who's late going to their door and putting something on seems ridiculous. But I, only the people you're gonna, you know, really are on the line of having to shut their water off. I wanted to go ahead and make sure we have enough time for our last agenda item. Kevin, did you still have something urgent to, on this item? Well, it just the, the, the numbers that Steve, that Steve ran were based on the ones who were that came from Stephanie that was about 80 who would who would get door hangers prior to shut off. And that's 80 and he ran it as being around 10 staff hours, 10, 10, 10 person hours for each time we do this. For each month, it would be 10, 10 uh, staff hours to do it for the 80 door hangers that we'd normally do. And that came from our current, our current people who would just were about to be shut off two days beforehand. Council member Hogue. That's just FYI. Thank you. Council member, did you want to weigh in? Yes, I, I, I'll try and be really fast, but as someone who's managed properties and knows how the water bills can, you know, be, um, right now you're currently sending the bills just to the tenants on rentals, is that correct? So yes. I think there should be, instead of making it optional to go to both the landlord and the tenant, I think it should be mandatory that it goes to both because if the landlord knew that there was gonna be a shut off, they could call them and get the water bill paid. My mom had to do that a ton of times on her rental properties, call the tenant directly. Cause in Bellevue, I think they send it to both parties. So that's just an option. It would maybe save shut offs. <laughs> no. I think that um, our utility bill and clerk, she is pretty amazing. She calls everybody she I mean she calls she'll call property I'll, I'll check to see if she calls the property owners but she really puts out an all effort to um to get to make it so people don't get their water shut offs especially this first round after after you know we had uh there was a moratorium on the shut offs but she is pretty pretty thorough about trying to get people to pay and not have their water shut off. But I will see if um, um, if she actually calls the property owners as well. Double check. I just very quickly wanted to say, it's been a while, um, but I've been a renter and I've been a landlord. <laughs> and I would say that I really like the staff recommendations for this in both of those, from both of those perspectives. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Council Member Lingle, did you, and also Kevin, did you guys have something quick or are we good to move on? I just wanted to say, we might want to check the State Landlord Tenant Act because I I might, I haven't been a landlord for a little while, but not that long ago. And there may be things in there that require us to do things one way or the other. Um, so just a suggestion that we we check that to see that what our notifications responsibilities might be 
in terms of shutting off a tenant's water. And Kevin, did you have something else or are you good? Well, it was just a quick thing to, to remind. Yes, it's, it's true that, you know, we can do it the other way where we, we have the tenants. But part of the staff recommendation comes from the fact that we have a lot of paperwork we have to do every time a new renter comes in because you have the old one leaving. Did they pay their bill? Didn't they pay the bill? Um, the owner, if they're, a, if they're a good owner, wants it to, not, to be paid. So maybe they'll pay it. And then we find out that, the, that there's a check already in the mail from the renter before they leave because they want their deposit back. And it's very complex. And so it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to discount the fact that it would also be helpful to, to send it to the, to the owner, but there's more, there's more to it we're trying to get rid of, which is this confusion, especially at the turnover of a rental that I wanted to make sure people aren't forgetting that that's, we'd like to get out of the business of that. We'd like to let the owners you know, they're, they're making money off it as part of their business and let them take care of making sure that the bills get paid. And we just take care of getting the bill sent to them. Thank you. So with that, we'll go to our last item, uh, the memorandum of understanding between city of Duval, Carnation, North Bend and Snoqualmie, the joint housing needs assessment with director Thomas. You are muted. I had to find my button. I'm like, where's my button? It's been too long. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council and members of our community. Uh, this evening, I am, and it is actually, I apologize. We were going to do a memorandum of understanding, but at the end of the day, we decided to go um, the way of an interlocal agreement. And so I did want to just clarify that. Uh, so why are we doing this? We've talked about this a couple times at council. We are getting ready to kick off our housing action plan. And the first phase of that is the housing needs assessment. And we are working um, with our Valley sisters, I guess I could say that, of Carnation, North Bend and Snoqualmie. Uh, Carnation has the same attorney as we do. So Ogden, Murphy and Wallace. And so Daniel and I talked um, with one another a couple of weeks ago and Zach Glell, who is their attorney, actually drafted the interlocal agreement. And we received it um, about actually just the day before the council packet was due. And so I wanted to at least get a first touch, get a discussion on this particular item. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of items really quick, because I know we have a new council member as well that hasn't seen um, some of the information yet. And it really is phase one. It is a partnership like we just talked about. Um, this is just from the first page so that everybody knows what an interlocal agreement looks like, what the purpose of it is. I hope everybody had an opportunity to at least glean um, and look at the uh, interlocal agreement. If you have any comments, you can certainly let me know or you can even email them to me as well. We've probably got at least three or four weeks before we bring it back for um, an action. At the next meeting, I will bring it back for just further discussion because by then the other Valley cities hopefully have given us some comments. So what are we gonna do? So you can see here, there's a little star by A. Um, these are essentially the tasks that we have set out for our housing action plan. And this first one is really the um, needy. It's the housing needs assessment portion. So you'll see that in our contract with commerce and then also as an exhibit um, with other tasks that'll be within um, our interlocal agreement, which ultimately lead to an RFP. So this excerpt right here is directly from our contract, which started with our application for the grant. And as we discussed you know, pretty early on, it's very narrowly focused by statute and what they'll fund and the expectations that they have um, of, of our community. So North Bend is expected to issue the RFP on behalf of all the cities. I would estimate that that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. Our city portion of that is $20,000. And the way we did our contract with Commerce is instead of us getting the $20,000 and then passing it on the North Bend, it'll go um, directly to the city of North Bend. We will issue a separate RFP for the housing action plan, which is the second phase of this project. 
And I would expect that we'll get that issued mid-February to the end of February. So we're starting to work on that RFP now. Again, Ogden Murphy and Wallace did draft the ILA. So we were very thankful that we had some in-house expertise for that and that um, technically we've already looked at it at least as far as two of the four cities. Um, I did want to give you a special note. Um, we are working currently actively right now with Commerce to extend the task that you see action one and step 1.1 through 1.9 to request an additional 60 to 90 days. So instead of that task ending in June of 2022, it would be September only because I think the holidays uh, somewhat dragged our schedule a little bit to try and get um, items to council, not necessarily for us, but we were able to get our contract with Commerce done and start the process. But the other cities um, either didn't have meetings or they just didn't have the capacity to put it on. So we're a little bit further ahead, but we need probably the extra 60 or 90 days because this project is a six month project, this first task. So I just wanted to let you know that and if Commerce agrees, which they have with the other cities, so I'm under the assumption they will with us as well, then we'll um, re-execute the contract and have the mayor sign it. Technically, I've held off on having her sign it while we're waiting to hear back from Commerce on this. The next step is to gather comments on the, uh, on the ILA from our councils and from our other cities. I would always say there's probably gonna be some changes when you're including four cities and four council members, for council bodies, that's 28 elected officials plus the mayors. Um, we will bring back the ILA to council for approval, but the next meeting will be probably our final touch base and then action in February. Are there any questions from council? Oh, that helps. Any questions for Director Thomas? Um, council Member Hoog. Not really a question, but more of a comment. I thought initially it was just North Bend that we, we were partnering with, but it's kind of nice that to see that other cities are too. Is that relatively new that they the other cities it, are? It's it's not really it's not new. North Bend. I think maybe what happened is we you know we, when we were talking about North Bend, they're going to be the I'll call the mothership of the project, so they'll. Um, and that's why we're entering into an ILA, they will project manage the housing needs assessment. So maybe I didn't just talk about the other cities enough, but um, all four cities have jumped in. So Kwame was the late goer in it. They weren't sure that they were going to be able to do it. They have a lot of staffing changes and, and a new mayor. And so they were, uh, they, they weren't sure. And so now I think they're pretty sure, at least we're hopeful that they are. And if they end up choosing to back out, then um, we'll move forward in the same direction and the three Valley cities will do, do the process together. That's great. I, I just somehow thought it was just North Bend. So I think that's, that's okay. Yeah. Probably because I talked too much about North Bend as kind of the gatekeeper. Thank you, Council Member Hogue. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Director Thomas, for that. Um, we've got a little bit of time, so we'll go ahead. Um, and before I adjourn, though, I'm just going to clarify with our clerk. So this is the same link for our city council meeting, correct? So when we have time in between meetings, are, should we just mute and turn our videos off, or should we exit and come back? It's fine to just leave it if we'd like to go take a break and then stay on. Yeah, just go ahead and turn off your your stuff and come back and just All right. go. Yeah. Sounds good. So um, we'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting right now at 649. Um, and we'll be back here at seven for our council meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Well, since we have the oath of office, I do have to wait for everybody to get on board before we start.
we are we're all here. Um, so if uh, if all council members can turn their video on, we'll be good to go. Um, Clerk, are you ready for me to start the meeting? All right. Yes. Uh, I'd like to call the November 4th, 2022 Duval City Council meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. And when the clerk is able to bring up the flag on the screen, I would invite all of you to join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the Republic to the for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, liberty, and, and justice for all. Thank you. And now our next step is uh, oath of office. We have a new member of council this evening and several of us that were reelected in November. And our clerk will kick us off uh, with that process. This is one of the most enjoyable parts of my job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, Amy, Mayor Amy Okerlander, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Amy Okerlander. Having been duly elected to the office. Having been duly elected to the office. Of City of Duval Mayor. Of City of Duval Mayor. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully and impartially discharge, that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of this office, the duties of this office as prescribed by law and to the best of my ability, as prescribed by law and to the best of my ability, and that I will support and maintain, and that I will support and maintain the constitution of the state of Washington, the Constitution of the State of Washington and of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations, thank you for your service. So looking forward to another four years with this group and uh, serving our community and hopefully, uh, hopefully COVID will die down and we can get some of our other big goals achieved in the next four years. Um, so moving on, uh, we have, um, I will get the correct order here. Uh, first up is Council Member Amy McHenry. Uh, so if you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Amy McHenry. I, Amy McHenry. Having been duly elected. Having been duly elected. To the Office of City of Duval Council Position 3. Having been duly elected to the Office of, sorry, say that one more time. Duly elected to the Office of City of Duval Council Position 3. Having been duly elected to the office of City of Duval Council Position 3. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of this office. Discharge the duties of this office. As prescribed by law. As prescribed by law. And to the best of my ability. And to the best of my ability. And that I will support and maintain. And that I will support and maintain. The Constitution of the State of Washington. The Constitution of the State of Washington. And of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations. Looking forward to another four years with you. Um, next up is Council Member Jennifer Naplin. If you please, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Jennifer Naplin. I, Jennifer Naplin. Having been duly elected to the office of City of Duval, position or hold on, sorry, position number six. Um, <laughs> having been duly elected to the City of Duval City Council member position six. Yes. Okay. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of this office. Discharge the duties of this office. As prescribed by law, as prescribed by law, to the best of my ability, the best of my ability, and that I will support and maintain, 
and that I will support and maintain the Constitution of the State of Washington, the Constitution of the State of Washington, and of the United States of America, and of the United States of America. Congratulations. And next up, we have the oath of our newest member, uh, Mr. John Isaacson, who comes to us from the Planning Commission. Um, and I can say I, for one, am thrilled to have you here, Mr. Isaacson. So if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me. Thank you. I, John Isaacson. I, John Isaacson. Having been duly elected. Having been duly elected. To the Office of City of Duval, Council Position 1. The Office of City of Duval, Council Position 1. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of this office. Discharge the duties of this office. As prescribed by law. As prescribed by law. And to the best of my ability. And to the best of my abilities. And that I will support and maintain. And I will support and maintain. The Constitution of the State of Washington. The Constitution of the State of Washington. And of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome, John. Uh, next, we have Michelle Hogue returning to council for her second term. Uh, if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Michelle Hogue. I, Michelle Hogue. Having been duly elected to the Office of City of Duval, Council Position Number 5. Having been duly elected to the City of Duval, Council Position Number 5. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of this office. Discharge the duties of this office. As prescribed by law. As prescribed by law. And to the best of my ability. And to the best of my ability. And that I will support and maintain. And I will support and maintain. The Constitution of the State of Washington. The Constitution of the State of Washington. And of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and Moving on to our last but not least, oath of office for uh, returning council member, first elected after appointed, uh, Mr. Rick Schaefer. So if you will please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Rick Schaefer. I, Rick Schaefer. Having been duly elected to the office of City of Duval, council position number two. Having been duly elected to the City of Duval, council position number two. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of this office. Discharge the duties of this office. As prescribed by law. As prescribed by law. And to the best of my ability. And to the best of my ability. And that I will support and maintain. And that I will support and maintain. The Constitution of the State of Washington. The Constitution of the State of Washington and of the United States of America. And of the United States of America. Congratulations. So what a fun night, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone here and especially have our newest member, uh, Council Member Isaacson with us tonight. Um, Clerk, and now that we've administered the oaths, would you please take the roll? Council Member Isaacson. Yes. Council Member Schaefer. Here. Mayor Pro Tem McHenry. Here. Council Member Hogue. Here. Council Member Naplin. Here. Council Member Lankel. Here. Council Member Lankel. Here. Mayor Overlander. Here. We have a quorum. Um, does anyone have any additions or corrections to the agenda this evening? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve this evening's council agenda? 
So moved, McHenry. Second, it's been moved and in sec seconded to approve the adoption of this evening's council agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Uh, do we have a motion to approve this evening's consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second, McHenry. It's been moved and seconded to approve this evening's consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Moving on to comments from the audience. Uh, first of all, uh, for any members of the audience that are attending um, via phone or on the web, if you are an attendee, our clerk will uh, elevate you to um, a panelist. And if you would like to speak, you may raise your hand and do so. Uh, you'll have three minutes to speak um, and on any topic you wish. Anyone who'd like to speak, to speak, please press the raise your hand icon or yes, the raise your hand icon. I'm not seeing any. We did receive one email comment from the public that I can read now, Mayor, if you'd like. Please go forward, Ms. Clark. Okay. All right. I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, this comment comes to us from Carol, I, I may not pronounce it correctly, forgive me, Q Felt. Um, Dear Council, you were elected to serve the city and its citizens. However, most of you seem to conflate oversight with micromanagement, which is not the same thing. Micromanagement is a huge contributor to employee stress and wastes so much time and resources. I'm sure the reason so many longtime city employees have left is due to that and your refusal to find resources in the budget to pay them commensurate wages. With the exception of the police and fire departments, every line item expenditure is needlessly and mind-numbingly debated as necessary or not. You were not elected to micromanage and harass city employees, but to serve. Set your egos aside and do your job, please. Thank you. <clears throat> is there any other written comment this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to scheduled items. Uh, item number one is the mayor's report. Um, so first up, I'll give a quick update and let uh, Public Works Director Ledeshevsky or City Administrator Oppel uh, chime in as needed. Um, first of all, uh, to just kind of give an update um, on our snow and ice situation, our crews have been working tirelessly uh, night and day, weekends and holidays uh, since the snowstorm came in. Uh, doing everything they could to uh, keep our streets clean. Uh, this was probably the first time, at least in recent memory, that we've had a, a major snow event and not had to close major roads through most of the, um, any major roads through most of the event. Um, we've definitely had some challenges with this particular weather event, with the rain um, coming and then the snow and the freezing. Uh, we've heard lots of folks having concerns about the inability to get the ice off the roads. Um, but that's not possible in this type of environment without damaging our equipment. Um, and so that means that our, our crews have to use other strategies. Uh, I think we all thought we were going to get off a little bit easier um, yesterday once the thaw happened. However, we had a strange convergence of uh, snow and hail followed by sunny skies right at the time the weather was dropping and it ended up with a really icy situation. Um, as soon as that occurred, our, our troops were out there uh, de-icing and sanding um, as best they could. Um, we are looking at uh, a potential another storm tomorrow, although the chances are becoming smaller of another four to eight inches tomorrow night. Um, and I think everyone in council is well aware that our weather in this area can be unpredictable. Um, and if the snow falls at, uh, at the wrong time, it's going to be difficult for our crews to keep up. Um, but I want to commend uh, Mr. Leniszewski and his team for an absolutely fantastic job, uh, folks coming in on the weekends uh, on scheduled days off to do the work and try and keep our roads safe for our community. Um, it's night and day uh, compared to what it was a few years ago when we had half as many uh, plows on the road as we do now. Uh, Mr. Leniszewski, did you have anything you wanted to add? 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Council, citizen Steve Leniszewski. I do not. The crew right, works hard, you. and uh, they just try to keep at it. So it's a big, it's a big dance in a large circus. Yes. That's for sure. Um, next up, just a quick update on waste management. Uh, Mr. Leniszewski and our city administrator have been working with waste management. Um, because of this potential new snowstorm, um, we obviously were not able to have garbage pickup, neither did most of the region last week. Um, and so they are working on potentially having waste man management come in and uh, park trucks with drivers so that they are staffed uh, so that folks do need to get rid of the garbage and can get to the location safely. Um, they'll have an option to do so. Uh, next up, um, briefly, I wanted to um, uh, check with council to see if you had reviewed the Sound Cities Associ Association legislative agenda that was sent out. Um, in brief, uh, the legislative priorities are investing in transportation instruction and mobility, promoting economic recovery, address the fiscal needs of cities to provide local services, address housing instability, and address um, law enforcement use of force, and continue support local continue supporting local control over city law enforcement policies to meet the needs of each community while recognizing the need for clarification of certain statewide reforms. Um, this is scheduled to be voted on by our board, uh, which I'm a member of this coming Wednesday. Um, and so if you have identified anything that you really can't support, um, if you have the opportunity now, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, we do have a few days. And if you'd like to discuss this in more depth right now, I'm happy to do so right now. All right, I think we've, through the PIC reports, it's come through multiple times, so that's good. Um, moving on, uh, we had the uh, Snoqualmie Valley Governments Association mayors meeting this morning. Um, there were our, all three legislators from the fifth legislative district were able to join us, Representative Ramos, uh, Representative Callan, Senator Mullet, and our uh, council member, Sarah Perry. Um, there was a discussion about a possible transportation package this year, uh, Senator Mullet, is cautiously optimistic that we may actually end up with a no new taxes um, gas, uh, no new taxes transportation package this year. Um, that said, it's likely to focus on a couple of big projects, for example, like Highway 18, uh, which the Valley Cities have been advocating for strongly uh, and has a tangential effect on the city of Duval. Um, that also gives me hope for our legislative request for the Highway 203 corridor study, because that really does directly tie into um, improvements on Highway 18 will most certainly uh, increase pass through traffic through the valley. Um, much of the discussion uh, this morning with the legislators uh, focused on their work on behavioral health, uh, from mental health and substance abuse to the issues with our schools um, and our children in schools and finding ways to support and um, making sure that the resources are there to support those in need. Um, Snoqualmie uh, announced that they have hired their ARPA coordinator. Um, they have not yet confirmed that they'll be sharing with North Bend, but that still is in, in ex expected. Um, so they have that person, I believe they've either started interviews or have actually made an offer on that position. Um, another item that was discussed uh, that I think is of importance, um, which we actually may want to add to a council uh, committee of the whole, uh, probably next month, is the updated legislative and congressional district maps for redistricting. Um, for those that are not aware, uh, portions of Snoqualmie, North Bend, and all of Carnation uh, are no longer in the fifth legislative district as of um, 30 days after the beginning of the legislature. Um, and that means that their district will be in the 12th legislative district, which encompasses a huge chunk of Schlang County um, all the way east to Wenatchee, I can't remember exactly everywhere. Um, but what impacts the city of Duval is that um, the 12th legislative district boundary now starts at our eastern city limits. Um, so everything outside of city limits that is not downtown will now be the 12th legislative district. Um, so over break, um, once those maps were finalized and the Supreme Court chose not to intervene, uh, I reached out to those legislators, uh, had my first meeting with Representative Keith Gaynor um, from Dryden. Uh, he's a, a former Chelan County Commissioner, very well versed in local government. I uh, met with him for probably about an hour and a half over break. 
um, had a great conversation with him about um, the needs of our area, um, how our unincorporated residents really rely on our city council members uh, for issues and that there's you know, definitely a lot of crossover, even though we're not technically in the district, their issues are our issues now as well. Um, so uh, we'll be meeting further. Um, I think that based on our conversation that uh, his cities in Eastern Washington have a lot in common with our cities in the Snoqualmie Valley. So uh, one thing that makes me very optimistic is um, that openness, I think will help start to bridge the east-west divide that we have in Washington state, particularly in the legislature. So I'm very excited about um, developing that relationship. Um, I know that he is eager uh, during interim to come to this side of the state and really get to know this area uh, much better. Um, and I think it's a huge opportunity for us to um, not just have our 45th district legislators who we keep, but also the continued relationship with the fifth district and the new relationship with the 12th district will put our city in a much stronger position um, statewide. So I'm very thrilled about that. I will be meeting with uh, Representative Hawkins um, next week, or I'm sorry, Senator Hawkins next week, and uh, um, hopefully uh, Representative Steele within the next couple of weeks. Um, once those introductory meetings are, are have completed, um, once session's over, we will try to get them uh, to potentially zoom in on a council meeting to introduce themselves um, and try and uh, loop them into our community as quickly as possible. Um, additionally, um, uh, that uh, the Snoqualmie Valley uh, mayor's uh, group is going to expand a little bit because of the changes with districting. Um, we will um, be including in our mayor's meetings, uh, the Skykomish mayor. Um, the Skykomish mayor has been, city of Skykomish has been kind of out on their own, but now that we not only have um, share that legislative representation, but also the county representation, um, all of the mayors of the Valley agree that we need to um, bring him in and collaborate um, and work more closely together. So that's gonna be an exciting um, thing for all of us moving forward this year. Um, next up, we had our North End Mayors meeting today. Um, really, it was, uh, it was only mayors on the call today, uh, simply discussing um, what our goals are, what our challenges are moving forward within our communities, and welcoming the two new mayors um, of Shoreline, uh, Rep, uh, Mayor Keith Scully, who is replacing Will Hall, who retired, and Nigel Herbig, who is the heir apparent uh, for Kenmore Mayor to replace David Baker. Um, with that, um, that's all I have this evening. Does anyone have any questions? Councilmember Naplin. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I, I maybe didn't completely catch about the North Bend ARPA coordinator. I had heard at some point that they had reached out and wanted to discuss possibly sharing a position. And I'm just curious, um, uh, exactly what did they end up doing? I'm just trying to learn from other cities. So they did not reach out to us on that. They went ahead and are going on themselves, but are likely to um, work with Snoqualmie and share with Snoqualmie. Okay. Okay. I must, I, I must have misunderstood. Yeah. I'm ahead. Great. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, um, you know, as legislative session gets moving, I'll do my best with my limited time to keep track of what's going on in Olympia and bring it forward to you all. Um, one final note, there is a bill that the governor will be moving forward um, that is of concern, but I have not yet seen a draft. Uh, that would remove all single family zoning in Washington state. Um, so we are going to need to have an extensive discussion about that and determine what our position is. Um, in particular, right now, it only would affect cities above um, 10,000, um, but our city will reach that threshold and that will certainly impact all of our infill development if it passes as currently discussed um, and uh, change our annexation areas significantly. Um, and take away our ability to um, really uh, meet the needs of our community and our character uh, with a pretty broad stroke bill. So as I get more information about that, we'll get that scheduled for a broader discussion, probably in committee the whole, um, as we get more information. So with that, uh, we have moved on to our King County Fire District 45 report.
with Chief Josh Erskine. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I feel honored to, that I got to listen to everyone get sworn in today. Um, that was nice. I know how hard it is to have to remember that uh, passage, so you all did a very good job. Uh, I have a, just a short report tonight. Uh, I will uh, probably in, um, in the, the February meeting or possibly March have a, a copy of our annual report that I'll provide to you. Um, but just to summarize 2021, uh, we reached 19 or 1192 calls for service. 61% uh, of those were EMS. Um, the other 39 were fire. I apologize for my typo on my report there. Um, while that doesn't seem to be a huge number, that's our largest calls for service ever. Uh, and it's a 10% increase over our calls for service last year. Um, I think that the district was able to really respond to that with the Cherry Valley station opening. Uh, that took about 30% of our call volume. Um, it kept our units available in, in the district uh, around the headquarters station uh, where we're a bit busier uh, and we were better able to serve the residents. Uh, so I'm happy to say that that was successful. Um, and just to kind of echo your words on the great work of the public works department over the snow, um, Steve gave a call uh, right away first thing in the morning. We had a great conversation. Um, you know, he got the, the trucks to help us where he could um, with keeping our aprons uh, clean uh, as they passed through, provided a, a map of the plow area so the crews were able to see the best routes to take to get out to the residents. And I just want to thank uh, him and his crew and, and everybody with the city for helping us out. So it's greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, I have nothing further if anyone has any questions for me. Thank you, Chief. Um, does anyone have any questions for the Chief? Council Member Schaefer. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Uh, just curious, do you think the uh, increased number of calls was directly due to COVID or just a combination of factors? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's probably three factors, a growing community, an aging community, and a global pandemic. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's it's a combination of things, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Certainly. All right, anyone else? See none. Thank you so much, Chief Erskine, for uh, coming and a happy new year. Always good to see you and uh, love having you come and give your reports to us. So thank you. Thank um, you very much. Take care, everyone. Good night. Um, moving on to council committee reports. Uh, first up is our report from finance and administration. Um, I guess I could chime in if that's okay with other committee members. I just, we're having a meeting on Thursday. It's just going to be the three um, council members on that committee right now and we're just gonna work on the procurement policy. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Patem. Uh, is there a land use report this evening? No, there isn't, thank you. Thank you, council member. Is there a public safety report? I will try to, oh, go ahead, Rick. <laughs> okay, that's all right, no, I'll chime in. No, no update on the public safety. Excellent, thank you. And public works committee. We have a meeting, I think it's next week. Yes, on the 12th, so no report for now. Excellent, thank you, Mayor Pratem. Um, next, we have ad hoc committees for council procedures update and human services grant policy. I'm assuming since this was discussed during the committee of the whole, there is nothing new, but uh, please feel free to share, Mayor Pratem, if there's anything else you'd like to add. Um, I don't have anything that would be to chair Hogue though for that committee. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. I apologize. I was getting human services mixed up with council procedures. Nothing new. I think we have a meeting. Um, it's not on my calendar, but we'll, we will be having a meeting within the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'll work with Sarah to figure out the date and get it on our calendar. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, council member. Um, now, moving on to other council reports, do any individual council members have anything they would like to report on this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to the city administrator update uh, with our city administrator, Mr. Kevin Oppel. Good evening. Um, 
Here's my update. I, I apologize for bringing the snow. Steve uh, Leniszewski has accused me of bringing the snow from Western Pennsylvania here, um, <laughs> but I deny it. The Trusted Community Partner Network uh, has given us a request as part of the Port of Seattle uh, and, and talks about for, for supporting small businesses, especially. They have a program uh, called this Trusted Community Partner Network where they would have navigators go out and engage with businesses, engage with community groups, um, focusing on, on all sorts of small businesses, minority owned businesses. They have asked for resources to help fund these navigators. Uh, there is a letter that was in the packet. Hopefully you've been able to look at. There's a larger presentation also uh, that's available to look at. I, I think we put it in the packet, which talks about it. There's on the 6th of January this week, there is a, about a 45 minute presentation as well. So if there's questions you have on the packet, you could either, we could try to get you uh, invited into it. I don't know if it's if it's we've only got one slot or if anybody can join. It's a Zoom one, so we can try to get you into it, or you can feed questions into me or Laura, who are going to be on it. Um, they're asking for eight thousand ninety dollars as our fair share for this, and there's a couple different ways we could do it. We could use ARPA funds. We could use if Save or Snoqualmie. I'll take a step back. There's a human services grant, which there's other grants from the Port of Seattle, which may uh, fund it, uh, or we may want to go with other routes. But there's a couple different routes we could use to help fund this 8,000 general uh, general funds, the Port of Seattle grants, or ARPA funds, because this is helping businesses get back on their feet. Um, we don't know yet how we'd want to do it, but that's one possibility. And I'd like you to look at the uh, the letter and the presentation and see if there's any interest in doing that. Um, that's that's the main thing from uh, from myself, and I think uh, Laura has more with the special event waiver and the temporary sign waiver. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Oh. Good evening, Mayor Council members of our community. I just have a couple of items. Uh, it is that time of year when we start to get special event applications in again, and with the continued pandemic, I would like to bring back um, a resolution uh, to waive those fees again for 2022, and the same or our temporary signs. As you know, we kind of rinse and repeat and these would expire at the end of the year. So we'll just uh, kind of, like I said, rinse and repeat those, change the dates, put in some new essentially findings of facts. And then um, we have been asked to be a guest speaker at the 112 Rotary Breakfast. So if you um, would like to join, that's at 7.15 start time up at the Rivery School District. Uh, Kevin, myself, and Brian uh, will be attending that meeting. They requested um, pretty much just an update on current development and what's going on in the city. So thank you. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for City Administrator Oppel or uh, Director Thomas? Council Member Naplin? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you brought forward the TCPN. I had sent an email about it uh, just before Christmas, so I haven't really heard back um, a response, but I, I was hoping to get, find out if our city was interested in TCPN, uh, which it's great. It sounds like we're looking into it, but also um, if there was a possibility to invite Saver Snoqualmie uh, to our city and give an update of how our port funds that we passed through to them have been utilized and just how we could um, work together. Uh, so I don't know if that's something we could have as a topic um, coming up. Uh, the Snoqualmie Valley Governments Association is inviting them to our next meeting. It's, it's going to be sort of a, um, you know, economic development focus uh, meeting, and we're inviting Saber Snoqualmie, uh, the chambers, the port, and, and, and going to you know, discuss how we can work together, but perhaps a Duval focused um, invite for Savers to call me would be good since we do pass through our, our port money to them. And then maybe they could teach us, tell us a little more about if they wanna do the TCPN as, as part of their program or if we should do it separately. Um, and, and that's, you know, to, to answer that is we, we haven't heard from them yet what their what the proposal is for the port grant this year. So it, it isn't, we're, we're starting to get to the point where the port grant is gonna come available in, in February. 
So that's why I was saying, I don't know how we would spend for the TCPN because we haven't heard yet. So we do need to contact Saver Snoqualmie and then find out what their intentions are. If they want to use the TCPN, if they want to be part of it, there is, if I, I didn't want to go into too much detail because I want everybody to look at it. There's two sets of navigators. So they're focusing on one is sort of ethnic communities, which is in the larger, uh, larger cities. And mm -hmm. then in the smaller cities, having their own sort of navigators working on small businesses because we have a different different focus of development. I don't know whether Snow Save or Snow me what they, if they want to do that or if they want to go and do another route. So that would be it'd be very important for us to get get involved with them. Their contact was Alana, who is no longer with us. So we're trying to get connected back with them. Does Save or Snow me provide some type of update of how the funds were spent and and you know just it seems like a lot of times when we do pass through, there's an expectation that they provide us with a report of what they've done with the money. Is that something they've been providing that council could get a copy of? I, I'm not sure. I know we've we've got their their end product, which the last one was a, a map, a walking map of the community as well as a website. Mm -hmm. um, so we were given, you know, so we've had access to see what the end result was. So I'm not sure that's something I don't know if Laura or uh, or Dana if we've gotten a report back from them. Dana looks like she has an answer. Yeah, I believe we do have a report that we turned in um, with our, our grant um, reimbursement request. So I can forward that to council if you'd like. Great, thanks a lot. Great, any other questions for the admin team? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on. We do not have any presentations this evening, but we do have four public hearings. Um, so the first one will be on the city of Duval fee resolution. Um, next is sewer capital improvement program and sewer general facilities charge. And then the 2022 comprehensive plan document docket. Um, so first I will open, officially open the public hearing for the city of Duval fee resolution. And uh, director Mason, is this you this evening? Yes, yes it is. Good evening again, council, mayor, and um, community. Dana Mason, finance director. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Some of you have already seen this presentation, but I'll just show it one more time. All righty. So we'll just go through the existing resolutions, um, fee adjustments, a new fee, and then open it up for questions. Um, so there are quite a few existing resolutions establishing uh, city fees. So a single fee resolution will provide one place for users, staff, residents, developers to look up fees, as well as help staff annually identify fees that need to be updated. Um, many of the resolutions that are listed here will be repealed under the res resolution since we're consolidating. And then a few will have sections that are repealed and a few will have um, annual Fee inflators are just going to be referenced in the resolution. And there's also some ordinances with fees that are referenced in the fee resolution, and then also Duval Municipal Code. Um, fees that are in code will be need to change and be changed by ordinance, but when changed, code can then point to the fee resolution. For example, the change to the code for special event permit application processing fee <laughs> was um, updated by to be updated by resolution was approved by council at, at the December 7th meeting. Sorry. <clears throat> um, there, the fees listed here are adjusted automatically by the average of the prior two year change in June to July, uh, Seattle, Tacoma, uh, Bellevue, CPIU, and it includes utility rates and building permit fees. Um, the fees listed here are adjusted by the average change in the prior two-year engineering news report construction cost index, or the average of the three-year, um, or it's called ENR CCI for short. And then structural plan review costs are adjusted twice annually by the International Code Council building valuations. And then these fees on this, this page will be up, adjusted annually just to reflect estimated costs. And then we have a new fee this year, or for 2022, a zoning verification letter, which provides interested parties with the current, the current zoning of a property 
any active code violations, the established legal use of the property, and whether structures can, on a property can be rebuilt. And a lot of cities do charge this fee. And are there any questions? For some reason, Mira, I can't hear you. Oh, I apologize. My phone automatically muted me. Uh, one of these days, I'll have a computer with a microphone that works. Uh, so uh, I simply just asked if any of the attendees um, would like to make public comment to go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing for the City of Duval fee resolution. Next, I will open the public hearing for the Super Capital Sewer Capital Improvement Program. Mr. Leniszewski. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, citizens, uh, anyone else listening, residents. Steve Leniszewski, Public Works. Okay, let's share my screen. And this is a little different format. I apologize with my screen share. Okay, we're all good. See the cover page. So we are presenting the City of Duval Capital Improvement Program for our wastewater and sewer utility. Uh, this has been a very long process. This is uh, analyzing our entire system, um, operations in the field, operations at treatment plant, uh, deficiencies, capital programming to repair or an or upgrade any deficiencies, uh, looking at our capital needs relative to growth, and then combining it all to come up with the second part of this, which is rates and fees and gen general facilities charges to cover the costs of our system. So with that said, the city has performed facility inspections and an analysis of our pump station operations center here at the treatment plant, as well as our utility lines. You have that ID. Oops, please scanners on. Uh, evaluate our land use, incorporated our current population and our growth forecast, conducted conveyance system capacity modeling, summarized efficiencies, developed projects and programs, assessed our sewer rates and general facility charges with a third party financial consultant. And all of that yields a, a list of projects, two pages long here. The bulk of the projects are wastewater treatment plan improvement projects pump station projects, conveyance improvement projects, and then citywide programs. We have created the CAP document. We have, again, they're not quite separated. They operate together as far as the programming with the capital improvement needs, as well as the funding, but we have broken those up into two separate um, action items. So they're clean. Um, we have done the math for our general facilities charge, which is a separate hearing. Uh, sewer rates were confirmed to be supportive of our current programming needs. We had conducted a public, well, I think tonight is our public hearing. Uh, we, um, we do hope to formally adopt the CAP after the public hearing is closed and discussion has occurred. Resolution has been prepared and we have, again, started and missed several meetings in a row. Um, Parametrics kind of kicked us off back in October, and we are where we are now. Um, so we will work on incorporating some financial policy recommendations, uh, reserves, and some um, rate-funded system investments via another resolution and working with our finance department. And I believe that is it. Nothing fancy here. Uh, there have been many discussions with the council. So at this point, I will go ahead and unshare, stop share, and the mayor can move on. Thank you, Mr. Lin Lin the public. Um, is there anyone, any member of the public that would like to provide public comment to this uh, item? If so, please uh, raise your hand and you will be called on. Seeing none, 
We will close the, this public hearing and move on to our next public hearing for the sewer general facilities charge. Uh, that hearing is now open. Uh, Mr. Leniszewski. Hello again, everyone. Steve Leniszewski, Public Works. And sorry, I'm not looking directly at you. The presentation is to my right. Uh, so what we have here, this is the financial package that supports the capital improvement program for the sewer system in whole. Again, sewer collection as well as wastewater treatment and process. We did work with parametrics to develop the plan and facilitate all the information we needed to, to derive our plan. And then we worked through parametrics uh, with financial consultant services group, which was another very long process. I believe in the agenda bill, uh, I did state the date we started this, which was more than a year ago. I'm pretty sure it was two plus. So I will yeah. go ahead. Are you meaning to share something right now? Yeah. Um, Okay, here we go. So uh, rate studies and overviews. Again, this, this I don't wanna be too brief. This programming and financial analysis supports the CIP that we have derived to take care of the city's needs over the next 20 years. Uh, we have looked at the rate revenue requirements. We have provided an update to the general facilities charge we do understand in the beginning of this that council's uh, guidance was to make sure that growth pays for growth. And I, I expressed it at a previous meeting that with our attorney present, we have done that and our financial consultant present to the, to the uh, limits of which we, we believe is fair, reasonable, and uh, as, honestly, as much as possible. There is that we have we started a brief introduction with financial analysis in january february came back with a list in september and then provided a full report with uh, not only parametrics but financial consultant services group um, we have looked at the utility rates we have looked at the two primary costs obviously operating and capital uh, operating costs are all inclusive which is our 402 fund for sewer Capital costs and programming is primarily placed in the 408 fund. <clears throat> so we have infrastructure and then expansion and upgrades. We do follow strict guidelines within Title 35 of the RCWs, allowing for equitable share of costs of such a utility system. The connection charges and our what they do. So typically, you'll hear a GFC, which is a, an, an applicant's connection charge for tying into the sewer system. It participates in recovering some of the costs from growth, reimburses the existing customers who have paid for some of the available capacity, uh, provides revenue as growth occurs for capital and debt service, it reduces the burden on rates, and we work to recover costs equitably. Results of this, obviously, to feed our CIP. I don't know why that is such a poorly scanned image, but our, our $9.9 .9 million of programming costs are eligible for what we would call reimbursement or collection through the general facility charge fee through growth. So our existing GFC is $11,953 as of December 31, 2021. This was written to be uh, uh, finished last year. Uh, the new calculated GFC, basically the numerator and denominators have changed such that we have an increase to $14,087, which was a $2,134 increase. Uh, that is exclusive of the rates that Ms. Mason just referenced as far as the programmatic increases to the general facilities charge based on engineering cost indices. So that number would be rolled into on top of this number because this was a 2021 number. Hope that makes sense. <clears throat> so we have adjusted in summary our, our fees for connection to facilitate building our CIP. Uh, we still maintain we should and recommend the cost indices, which is the preceding two years for the engineering news record construction cost index 
having two years of an indices smooths out some of that rapid increase or decrease in construction costs. Um, there's years where you've got 2% or 7%, so um, trying to be a little more reasonable with not only collecting a uh, rate to help grow the fee so it's relative to our construction cost uh, that we incur, but also not be a wild swing. Uh, so there can be a little bit of programmatic planning um, from year to year. And then we have talked about re revisiting uh, the financial plan in a few years. I know it's important to council. Should we either A, have a windfall with a grant or a loan that we maybe didn't preliminarily put into the planning process? We can reassess our fees. Uh, if we have a, a glut of permits that come in and we programmed a certain number of revenue from general facilities charges that maybe is two or three fold, we can look at how that might re make rates react. So we did talk about looking at our fees every couple of years. And certainly we can do it any time. And if there is, again, a big glut, we can we can do that um, on an annual basis. It doesn't have to be every couple of years, but it is financially prudent to review that every couple of years. Uh, we do have conservatism built into our analysis. Um, we have done our best to project over the next five years a very, I would say, reasonable and realistic approach to how many units we do expect to come in. Um, even though we are in the moratorium, we do have... 500 units in the pipeline. They're pretty well programmed um, from year one to the end of year five. And then we may need to additionally uh, provide for some capital needs uh, over the long term. But again, this is a you know 10 year programming and financing on a 20 year program, and it does have planning level assessments and assumptions in it, and we can adjust over time. That's all I have to present for the general facility charge. Thank you, Director Lenaszewski. Um, and with that, if there are any members uh, of the public that are attending that would like to speak, please raise your hand and you'll uh, be, the, be afforded the opportunity to put your comment into the public record. Not seeing any public comment, uh, this public hearing is now closed. And we will move on to the public hearing for the 2022 Comprehensive Plan doc, I'm sorry, 2022 Comprehensive Plan docket, uh, which is now open. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, you may experience a little bit of deja vu. Uh, we're discussing again the 2022 Comprehensive Plan amendments uh, for the benefit of the public. Um, just to give us a recap on where we're at in the process is we had our application window back in August. Uh, we introduced these applications to the Planning Commission and City Council in December. Planning Commission made the recommendation to City Council on December 8th. And tonight we're holding a public hearing uh, before the City Council makes a final decision on the 2022 docket. So we did receive nine applications. They were all received or submitted by city staff and assigned uh, file number CPA 22-001 through CPA 22-009 as indicated in your packet. Uh, the first one is regarding a uh, redesignation and a concurrent rezone of three parcels that were, will soon be dedicated to the city for public park space. These include um, two new parks in the um, Ridge of Big Rock development and a new park in the Rio Vista development off of Northeast 143rd. Um, as those become uh, property of the city, we'll update our zoning map and future land use map to change it from its current zoning classifications to parks and open space. Uh, this is an amendment to our uh, future land use map uh, in our comprehensive plan to change. Mr. Roy, the I'm going to break in really quick. I don't your presentation, if you have a presentation up, is not showing. Oh, your sorry. presentation is not showing. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> Thank you for telling me because yes, I was yep. just thinking it was, <laughs> was going okay. My apologies, hold on. Uh, when I hit the share button, oh, here we go. I missed one extra step, it looks like. My apologies. Um, okay, let me back up just uh, real quick to go to the first um, application I was talking about. 
so again, this is the rezone of uh, park space that will be acquired by the city from their current zoning status within Rio Vista and Ridge of Big Rock um, to parks and open space. Uh, the second application that we have is a um, removal of a pre-designation for parks back to North UGA Reserve. Uh, so this little square here will uh, change back to gray under this proposal. Uh, as this, again, just a little bit of background, the school district is no longer considering purchasing this parcel. Uh, so there's no need to put it into um, uh, public facilities. Uh, this next one is regarding to the 10 acre parcel that the city purchased adjacent to Big Rock ball field. It has a pre-zoning designation currently of R4. Um, of course, with the city having an interest in not developing this as residential, but instead as additional park, uh, we felt it's necessary to change the pre-designation status of this from R4 to parks and open space. Uh, so the city, uh, this is a placeholder amendment. Uh, the city's in the process of completing a housing needs assessment and action plan within the city. And so as soon as this assessment is completed, we'll know whether or not um, any in the specific amendment is needed to our comprehensive plan. And so we have that application here uh, just in case that becomes a necessity. Uh, this next one is also a placeholder. Um, it's to address and update uh, the city's water system uh, comprehensive plan. So as we update that plan, if it triggers any amendments to our actual comprehensive plan, um, we have this placeholder uh, in place for us. Uh, the second one is also a placeholder here. Um, this is to address um, updates to our sewer system capital improvement program, which I believe Steve um, just spoke on earlier, but if there are any uh, necessary comprehensive plan changes that come out of this update, we have this placeholder in place to do so. And the next one is a placeholder as well. Um, it depends on the update of the capital facilities, <coughs> sorry, city facilities inventory and summary plan. Uh, so as we update that, it may trigger uh, changes to our comprehensive plan. And so this serves as a placeholder um, to do that work as well. And the last two here are the TIP and the CIP. So these again are documents that live outside the comprehensive plan as well as the last few um, applications I mentioned live outside the comprehensive plan. And so every year we update the TIP uh, and the CIP for the six year projections. Um, if these updates trigger any need to our comprehensive plan, we have these applications in as placeholders. In case that happens, it usually doesn't, but uh, just in case we like to have these um, applications in as placeholders. Um, the next step would be for the city council to um, establish the final 2022 docket by resolution uh, following the public hearing. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend at their December 8th meeting that the city council include all nine applications on the final 2022 docket. And just of note, uh, and for the public, uh, inclusion of an application on the final 2022 docket is not automatic approval of that proposed amendment. Um, it's only authorizing city staff to um, continue processing that application for final decision by the city council later in 2022. And that concludes staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Davis. <clears throat> Same procedure as the last three public hearings. If there's anyone attending this meeting, um, members of the public that would like to provide public comment, please raise your hand and you will be called on. Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed and we will move on to new business. First item on the agenda is Agenda Bill 22-01A, Council Selection of Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this is for appointment and decision. And currently we have, uh, the council had selected uh, council member McHenry, <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem Remington uh, upon his departure for Mayor Pro Tem. And at this time, I would like to open it up for nominations for the Mayor Pro Tem for 2022. Council member Schaefer, you're on mute council member. Thank you. I'd like to nominate uh, Amy McHenry for Mayor Pro Tem. 
Second, Michelle Hope. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for Mayor Pro Tem this evening? Seeing none, all those in favor of Amy McHenry to continue for Mayor Pro Tem for 2022, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Congratulations, Mayor Pro Tem McHenry. I am very excited to continue working with you. This last two months has been a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to all the work that we're gonna get to do this coming year. Um, for those that don't know, when Amy and I meet one-on-one, -on -one, we're calling it Amy Squared. So we're already starting off with a little bit of fun. <laughs> so if you ever need to reach both of us, just say Amy Squared, we'll know who you're talking to. Um, so Amy's doing a fantastic job already. Um, and she's really settled into the role and integrating with administration very well. And I couldn't be more pleased um, to have her in that role working uh, so closely with us. So thank you um, and congratulations. Uh, moving on to agenda bill 22-02A, process for appointment of council member to vacant position four. Uh, for discussion, city administrator Oppel. So if you reviewed the agenda bill, we had we fall under RCW 42.12.070, uh, which is filling nonpartisan vacancies. We have 90 days from the time of the last, uh, from the time that the uh, council member, which is council member Remington, uh, filed their, their vacancy by, by resigning. Uh, that time is, I think, January 31st. If at that point we do not have a council vote for a new member for a new appointment, it will then go pass to the King County Council. Uh, there is no extensions allowed. There's no form for extensions. It would go to the County Council. Uh, there has been discussion with Chair Balducci at the County Council about what would happen then if we then you know, had, had recommendations or weren't ready for it because we have had some issues with the weather, with with meetings, the time of the season and so forth with applications. I think everybody knows that. Um, they cannot do anything. They can't promise anything. They said that in the last few cases, they have listened to the recommendation of a city after the 90 days had, had elapsed, um, but they can't really promise that that would automatically whatever the recommendation from the city council is. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't. I'm sure that the county council wants to follow the wishes of the community, but uh, at the 90 day. So it behooves us to try to get uh, an approved position prior to January 31st. Uh, if you continue to look at the agenda bill, there is the procedures which come straight out of the currently approved 2015 council procedures. It is a kind of a lengthy process. Um, and so I, I, I leave it there to, for, for the council to decide whether they want to go verbatim from through this and use this process or create your own process. You are a legislative body, so you can choose to make your own process as long as you're all in agreement with it. And I'll leave it to the pro tem to, to push discussion, but we have gotten three applications in at this point. Um, so we were kind of worried that we only had one in and that was going to be, uh, possibly difficult for you to make a decision because it's sort of, do you pick the one person or do you, you know, so this way you at least have a selection. Mayor Pretend McHenry. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, like we talked about at our agenda meeting, I, and as I emailed the council as well, that I felt like we should leave it open at least until tonight and see what happened. We do now have three applications. As you know, if we go over three, then we, you know, we'll probably need to have an extra meeting this month to make a decision because first you would have to reduce it down to three if there's four or something like that and then make a decision. So I guess I'm feeling like we have three applicants. I think they're all qualified um, as far as I saw from the clerk so far. So I think that, you know, we could be ready to make a decision if everyone else is on board with it at the next uh, council meeting. And so we could take the time between today and until that to call, email, talk, meet with um, the applicants as needed. So to make your decision, but that's what I was thinking is maybe we could officially close it now. Council member Naplin. I, just want to say I think that's a great idea and I agree. Great. Are there any objections to closing the process? 
Seeing none, I think you have consensus, Mayor Pro Tem, and we can move on. Uh, next agenda bill is agenda bill 22-03A, acceptance of the King County Community Development Want Grant for Northeast 142nd Street Sidewalk Project for discussion. Um, we did have uh, Ms. Polanco listed on here from Public Works, but I believe she's not here this evening and it'll be Mr. Leniszewski. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council, citizens, Steve Leniszewski, Public Works. So I can do the screen share if you so chose. This, uh, not to minimize anything, this is the acceptance of a grant from our friends at the Community Development Lot Grant Group within King County. Um, it is for replacement of, or actually creation of sidewalk on the 142nd corridor um, between 278th and 282nd. This is a two-phased project. Sorry, I'm gonna skip pages real quick. Go to the vicinity map for those who may or may not know. Um, this is the orange section. Again, 278th is in Crestview Estates. This is getting you into Parkwood and the Duval Highlands Mobile Home Park. Um, and this is then 282nd, getting you down to Big Rock Road. So as you are aware, there are no sidewalks there, very few amenities, parking is uh, quasi all over the place. We worked very diligently with the mobile home park manager. Uh, she has left her role, so we're not very excited about that. They do have someone else in place, but for two years, she was very instrumental. Uh, we had to conduct a survey and the survey that was conducted is a household income survey per the conditions and requirements of the King County CDBG group. Um, there was a preliminary, preliminary one, and then we did a final one towards the end of the granting uh, filing process. So you have to have a certain percentage qualify as low income to begin and be eligible for these grant dollars. So with that said, back out. Uh, inside your council packet, there's an agenda bill. I'm not trying to skip too fast for any reason other than to get to the head in here. Um, we have a contract here. It is very boilerplate. Um, $280,000 of CDBG funds are eligible or given for construction of this um, project. There was a project cost table provided in the packet. Pretty complete for programming. We are trying to facilitate use of a development uh, budget table. Uh, this would change over time and be kind of a, a stamp in time that would you would see the same table grow and change as we migrate through from preliminary work through design work, obviously to construction and then and then an end source um, final project table. So it's very new. Um, with that said, there are some language edits that our friends from King County are going to recommend. So I'm hopeful to not have to come back, but as the action item says, I'm sorry, this is not to get back to. So the, so the change to that recommendation is uh, currently the contract is draft. We are waiting for King County to add language to the contract about HUD's new Section 3 guidance for hiring local minority and low-income workers. So because of the holiday season, King County was, was unable to provide the additional language prior to this meeting. Staff have. Staff will the city attorney review and approve the additional language prior to the mayor's final signature if we have council approval and then recommend the city council accept the grant funds this evening with the caveat of that change. Um, had one question regarding some survey work and the potential to uh, not redo survey work relative to the county and CDBG's druthers of household income. Uh, if they do need an update, we obviously would have to comply, but we don't expect that. But I think the survey and outreach to the community in the area and its adjacency is a uh, high priority. Um, so we do expect to do that, get a engineer on board, do some outreach um, and 
probably some re-education with the new property manager there because again we had a complete champion on our side of it who was very instrumental in, in helping get not only the surveys done but help the folks understand what was going on out there she was instrumental in you know making some of those improvements you can see in front of the mobile home park on 282nd currently or 142nd you know re-establishing the ditch that was them we did some ditch work on the far west end um, cleaning out their storm drain facility per the NPDES requirements and working with larissa so they've, they've been a, a real good partner we expect that to continue but we do have a new relationship to build with their manager so with that said i would anticipate uh, fielding any questions from this group council member schaefer Just a clarification, Steve. Um, I want to make sure, are we talking just one sidewalk on one side of the street or two sidewalks on both sides? Yeah, great question. So it is a sidewalk on the northern side of the street, curb gutter sidewalk, some park strip. Uh, we would do full drive lanes, so we may widen a scotch to the south, but there is a large ditch on that side, so probably curbing. Um, any other ditch work that would need to be done. And then we, we are required to do some low impact development uh, drainage management up there per the grant itself. Uh, it is on till, so there will be some work we can do. There will be um, different types of treatments rather than a, a typical pipe, pipe network and, and detention facility. So we will have that to provide for, but that's part of the project. Okay, good. I, what One other, I guess more comment. And Steve, can you throw your your uh, map back up the satellite view, if you could? The the bigger one, if possible. I almost pushed the leave button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if you could just enlarge the intersection uh, with two. I guess that's two hundred seventy eight there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, perfect. Okay, so I walked through there uh, a lot, and uh, uh, it's a you know nice. It's a very nice area to walk walk through. The lack of sidewalks uh, in general don't bother me, but here's uh, here's been my concern. This particular intersection is actually somewhat blind, and as you can see, there's a it's it's not a right, complete right angle. It, it's uh, you know there's actually a, a curve to it. Cars can come through there at a relatively good clip. And I don't believe there's a stop sign or anything uh, there to slow them down, if I recall correctly. Right. Uh, my concern is not, you know, not so much, you know, old guys like me walking dogs, but it's more kids, uh, kids walking, kids on bike, that type of thing. Uh, that intersection is a little, in my opinion, a little dangerous. I believe sidewalks would add uh, significant safety uh, factor for that uh, that particular area. So not only is it just nice to have a place to uh, you know to walk off the street, but uh, that'll improve the uh, safety factor as well. Yeah. So we will uh, thank you for the comment. We, when we do get to design phase, I, I don't know that this will become a two way stop, but we will do some engineering review. Uh, we never do stop control, speed control stop signs, so they have to meet specific warrants. Um, but we will look at that. I, I completely hear you and understand it is a funky chicane. So whether it gets maybe uh, traffic circles or more chicane and, and alignment, we'll, we will work on that in the design phase. So once we do get this grant uh, hopefully approved, we will begin the process and solicit for an engineer. Um, not only meeting our own requirements for solicitation, but the, the confines of our friends from King County and CDBG. So we'll have a, a process for that. It won't be a, a large design project, nowhere near, of course, like the sewer uh, wastewater treatment plant for train project, but it, I mean, it'll be a, yeah. you know, a low six figure, I'm sure, endeavor. I think he has to in there, so yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds great. I think even without a stop sign, I think just having sidewalks there will improve uh, safety considerably. Uh, Council Member Langle. Uh, yeah, I've um, I've been following this project and the land ownership, um, and just a, a piece of information to share with everyone. A couple of years ago, 
coinciding with uh, what Steve just reported, the, the property was actually sold to a new um, LLC corporation. And uh, it's not uh, a type of corporation that we can assume is going to continue the property as mobile home park. So I think that's an important thing when you come to um, community outreach. Now, um, the grant application uh, in the section titled Population Served, paragraph seven, is a really well written uh, submission. But one of the things that it says is um, relates to having a second outreach effort. Um, now we've approved some additional staff uh, job description that can do some of that. Um, and I'm prepared to actually make a motion to move this bill. However, I have some specific language uh, I think is necessary because of the way the grant application is written. And I have talked to Steve about it. Um, I didn't hear any objections. And I've also talked to our attorney about it because it's, this is not, my, my comments do not affect the form of the contract at all. It's really making it clear that council is, um, is uh, requiring that that additional outreach occur. And I think it's really important because it's one of the uh, most likely very low income neighborhoods in the city. And it is a, a place where the population is very diverse and language may be a barrier. So um, I'm ready to make a motion if other people don't have comments. Um, Council member Napland. Yeah, I, I don't have a, Councilmember Langle, you can go ahead, but I did have a couple comments, so I hope you don't mind if I wanted oh, to- Oh, no, no. I'm... Um, so uh, one thing about that, this project that I have a little bit of a concern about, I know it was a topic of discussion when it first came through, is that the project got qualified because of the low income nature of the area, and yet potentially we could be displacing parking for the very people that allowed it to be eligible. <laughs> and so I, I do have some concerns that that parking um, is used and, and needed by the, the people who live in the mobile home park. And I, I really want to make sure that we um, look closely at that. I, I know there's teenagers that live in there that have vehicles to get to and from school. There's, you know, people who sometimes park their work vehicles that that's their only option potentially and I, I would just really hate to displace that and you know we're trying to do something nice for their area and it backfires a bit it would feel um somewhat ironic um so I I, I don't know exactly we aren't approving a design here but I, I know this was a topic of discussion uh when the project came forward um before and so maybe Director Lanchesky can address what the plan is and I, I think outreach is 100% you know part of that determining the need is that parking needed I I mean other people in other neighborhoods have usage of public frontage for parking and to take all of that away um, for that quite a large area would be I think would be uh, create a, a challenge um, I also want to say that I love that template spreadsheet of the total development costs. I just am thrilled to see that. I, I think it'll help. And I'd love to see something consistent like that for all of our projects, just so we can be familiar with a, a common format. So thank you for doing that. It looks really good. Yeah, on your one comment on parking, like I said, when we get to the design phase, we do anticipate full parking to the extent we can on one whole side. There isn't really productive parking on two sides of that road right now. There is it meets nowhere near any sort of design standard. Um, and it is technically, you know, it is not safe as it sits. So we we will be working with them. We are pre-planning all the preliminary numbers on layout have incorporated widening and parking on the sidewalk side, which is the north side. So. Great, thank you. Anyone okay. else questions or comments for Mr. Leniszewski? Council member Isaacson. You moved me when you spoke. I had to find the mute button there, Mayor. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Councilmember Ling, I got a question for clarity on your statement on the, the property being purchased by a, a new LLC. Yes. Uh, and forgive me for everyone else who may already know this. Um, uh, uh, appreciate the education. Um, are you, I interpret your statement as 
um, the person, the, the LLC that purchases property may do something else with that property. Is that this, is that your speculation? Uh, it, it is my speculation. And um, I won't go into all the reasons for that because it would take up too much time. But no. um, I looked at the history of the ownership of the property and it was a, a, a corporation originally that this is what they did. They did mobile home parks, they rented out paths. And, um, but what happened was that LLC transferred to a new LLC. Now, what we can't determine is whether any members of the original LLC are also part of the new LLC. But the, the, the transfer price was about 9.8 million. Um, but the, there's some interesting things about the property in, in the way it was originally done in terms of the, the streets and the sewers and so forth. So it's not in bad shape that way, but the mobile homes themselves are quite old. And they would not, I, in my view, in my experience with mobile homes, I think uh, council member uh, Hogue also has some experience with this. They would not be able to be moved. And so if, if that is redeveloped, those people will likely be displaced. Now in this state, there are specific laws around um, mobile home parks and displacement, um, but it doesn't necessarily, it, I mean, as a practical matter, it rarely present, uh, prevents the displacement. So um, we can't tell what's gonna happen to these folks. All we can do is make sure that our project is uh, the information is shared appropriately and hope for the best for them, quite frankly, because, um, you know, because it's, I've driven that community a number of times in the last couple of years since the project was proposed. And um, yeah, so I, I think that's a high probability. So thanks for clarity. The reason why I asked for that clarity is, are we saying that, is there any concerns to you if this gets developed into something else that the grant would be at risk because of a different development? Oh, no, I don't okay. think right, so. Thanks. No, no, not at all. Thanks. I don't so, have that risk anyway. <laughs> I will still very slightly off topic um, to give council a bug in your ear. Um, this property is not zoned for mobile home parks and multifamily housing. Um, yeah. If council chooses to address that, that may be able to be addressed in the comprehensive plan update, which is frankly, a long-term goal of mine to make sure that we preserve that area for affordable housing. So I will just leave that statement since it's off topic of acceptance of the grant um, and let that go. Um, and if anyone is willing to or ready to make a motion to accept this grant, um, I'd be happy to entertain it now. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to make that motion since I have some specific wording. Okay. Um, well, you need to make the motion and then an amendment. There is no, the, there, I already discussed this with our attorney. There's no resolution. Okay. Um, and, okay, so it doesn't change the contract. I want to be real clear about that. What it does, it, the motion is, um, I make a motion to approve this contract as presented with the understanding administration will be um, conducting additional outreach as described in the grant application um, that was approved by council on May 5th, 2020, under Agenda Bill 20-37A. Is there a second? And Council Member Knapp. All right, it's been moved and seconded to approve acceptance of the King County Community Development Brock Grant for Northeast 142nd Street Sidewalk Project with the conditions as described by Council Member Langle. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. please say no. Motion passes. Moving on to our five items of unfinished business. First up is Agenda Bill 21-106C, resolution approving the 2021 Sewer Utility Capital Improvement Program for discussion and or decision. Um, this has been discussed extensively. I recognize that we have a new council member on board. Um, so uh, if council would like to discuss this before the motion, that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, but if you'd like to go ahead and make a motion and uh, vote now, that is acceptable as well. If I council can, as a new council member, um, you guys move forward without wasting time and uh, we'll catch up on it. Yeah, and council member Isaacson, I apologize. 
I had hoped to get to you in the last two to three weeks of the month here, but it's kind of been shot. So. I, I trust the council. <laughs> so you guys move forward. Thank you. Uh, council member Naplin and then Schaefer. Yeah, just really quick. I was excited to hear that uh, we, we may see some kind of uh, maybe a resolution about financial policies related to some of the recommendations. And I would love to see that. Um, I think some of my concerns plan could be addressed by financial policy. I'm seeing a head shake. Can't hear you very well at all. Oh. <laughs> Is it just me? Mm -mm. Is Steve, can you mute? No. Yeah, I think it's Steve's. Uh, whenever Steve talks, there's this weird backgroundy noise. Yeah. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. It was you, Steve. Um, <laughs> Director Lanishevsky. I was sorry. I'll be more formal. Um, no, I, I just wanted to say that I was excited to see that we will be seeing some financial policies coming forward as they relate to utilities. And I, I'm hoping to see uh, potentially it addressed how we um, might utilize debt and um, the you know minimum reserves and, and some of those other things. I, I had kind of an interesting conversation with uh, our new city administrator about uh, how some of the ideas I had are policy related and, and how to communicate that via a policy discussion. So I, I hope to see that coming forward um, because I, I do think it would help address some concerns of how growth pays for growth and, and the timing of revenues and um, things like that. So I don't know when that's going to come forward. Maybe you could help me out of, of when we'll see that. Yeah, I would lean towards Dana's time frame. I would imagine that we will go to committee first to talk about those uh, reserves uh, we as staff would love to have a reserve number we could quantify other than, oh, we did 600000 last year for Operation Reserve. Why? I don't know, because now it grows by 2%. I, I, yeah, we would love a, a roadmap, um, so you have no argument there. I just don't know what Dana's work plan is. I think I think it is an FMA committee, Dana, process, so I know there's a couple things on the plate ahead of it, but I, I, I yeah. Yes, sooner than later, but not tomorrow. How that? Thank you. Council Member Schaefer. If there's no more discussion, I was going to make a motion uh, to uh, accept the uh, agenda bill. Is there any additional discussion? And, and, and for a point of clarification as well, a motion can be made anytime. Um, I just, uh, you know, try sure. to, our new member, try to allow conversation before. Typically, when we're at this point, we make a motion and then have discussion. Um, but Council Member Legal did have her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about um, CIPs in general, which is we do have an uh, opportunity with uh, ARPA money to maybe do some, some funding of things. And uh, I did attend the training on that and I've read the treasury bill stuff uh, several times now. So I'm really hoping that with all of these capital improvement um our major major things on our list we are right now thinking about placement of that arpa money particularly because we're going to need our debt capacity for some other really big things in the next few years and anything we can do to um otherwise fund things uh that are eligible i i think is super important so that's just a comment i'm ready to go mr K council member schaefer Okay, I'll see. I move to uh, approve Agenda Bill 21-106C, resolution adopting the updated sewer utility capital improvement program and project list. Second, McHenry. Any further discussion? Mayor, question to the clerk. Yes. Uh, Council Member Schaefer read the Agenda Bill correctly, but clerk, is that correct? It's 21-106. Does that mean the new 2022 number? Mm. Sorry. Good point. Hopefully you're no, here. it's, I mean, it's a holdover from the unfinished business from 2021, so I think it's good. I just want to ask because I don't want to do it again at another Yeah, time. I don't blame you. <laughs> For the eighth time. Great. 
All right, it's been moved and seconded to approve Agenda Bill 21-106C, resolution approving the 2021 Sewer Utility Capital Improvement Program. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Moving on to Agenda Bill 21-107C, resolution approving the 2021 Sewer Utility General Facilities Charge for discussion and decision. Um, the same goes here with Mr. Uh, Rep, uh, Councilmember Ivesixon being new. Um, uh, we can discuss uh, to start or uh, happy to entertain a motion um, and then have discussion. Uh, Councilmember Langel. Uh, yes, I will make a motion uh, to approve. I want to make sure I have the right one. AB 21 dash. 107C resolution approving the 2021 sewer utility general facilities charge. Second, McHenry. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded to approve agenda bill 21-107C resolution approving 2021 sewer utility general facilities charge. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Moving on to agenda bill 21-119B, ordinance revising DMC chapter 6.02, garbage collection for discussion and decision. Uh, Director Thomas. Sorry about that. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of our community. Uh, this evening, we are finalizing our chapter 6.02 garbage collection update. Uh, this policy update is related to uh, garbage recycling compostable collection within the city of Duval. Last year in 2021, we entered into a new contract for services with waste management. That new contract became effective January 1st. This is really a house cleaning, um, what we call house cleaning update to definitions, description of services and obligations of residents to receive the services. Um, the contract again uh, started in 2022 on January 1st and expires at the end of 2031. If there are any other additional questions, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Director Thomas? Seeing none, do we have a, uh, a motion to approve this agenda bill? I move that we suspend our rules and procedures. Isn't it still just a, that's what it says on page 88, we're supposed to suspend our rules, no? It is a second time on the agenda bill, but I believe we've discussed it more than three times. Um, so okay. if you that formality, that is just fine. That's okay. I'll move to approve agenda bill 22-03A, approving the contract for 2021 King County Community Development Block Grant Funds and authorizing the mayor to execute the contract following review of the contract by the city attorney. Oh, council member, oh, wrong, wrong agenda bill. It's uh, agenda bill 21-119B regarding garbage collection. I thought I was on that one. Oh, I must supposed to be on four. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll switch over. Okay, now I'm on the right page. I move to approve agenda bill 21-119B, ordinance updating Duval Municipal Code chapter 6.02 garbage collection as presented. Is there a second? Second, Chief. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving Agenda Bill 21-119B, Ordinance Revising DMC Chapter 6.02, Garbage Collection, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. Moving on to Agenda Bill 21-137B, Resolution Approving the 2022 <coughs> plan docket for decision. First off, uh, before Mr. Davis speaks, uh, we're moving along pretty quickly, not lots of questions. So I would like to ask if anyone would like to start this with making a motion. Council Member Langle. I make a motion 
to approve AB 21-137B resolution approving the uh, 2022 comprehensive plan docket. Second, Schaefer. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving Agenda Bill 21-137B, resolution approving the 2022 comprehensive plan docket, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. say no. Motion passes. Uh, final item on our agenda tonight is Agenda Bill 21-138B, the resolution adopting the 2022 consolidated fee schedule for decision. Would some, anyone like to make a motion? I move we approve Agenda Bill 21-138B, uh, approving the 2022 fee resolution. Councilmember Isaacs on a second. All right, we, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Council Member Naplin? Yeah, I, I had it in my notes that we were maybe going to take the um, transportation impact fee and make it consistent with the two-year um, instead of using the three-year. But maybe I'm remembering that differently. I, I feel like I brought it up a couple of times and for some reason I, I thought we were going to do that. But maybe, like I said, maybe my memory has failed me. It was the only one of the impact fees that was uh, set on the three year instead of the two year. Oh yeah, I think that was right. I do recall kind of hearing that maybe from when it was presented the first time. I think I brought it up in committee and then when it was brought up at council, I, I mentioned it again. So if there wasn't a formal submission of a request for amendment and a support by council, it wouldn't end up in the resolution. So a discussion does not equate to um, an amendment without majority council support. Oh, my impression was that staff, uh, I thought staff was in agreement that that made sense. And I, I would you like me, I wanna make sure staff feels the same and I, I can put forward a, a request to change it. Um, we, could we pass it as is and then bring it up? I mean, change that specific fee with the next? Well, and point of order is you can make a, an amendment to a resolution on the floor. Uh -huh. you, and that's a simple one because there's not a lot of verbiage that has to be changed. You're just changing the number from two or from three to two. So uh, you, you could pass it just with, by amending it. I don't, I don't remember Steve or Dana, if you had any objections to it, you were going to look into it, Steve. That was the last I had remember whether there was any reason to continue to use three years or two years. Yeah. I'm just looking. Uh, thank you. Mr. Oppel. I'm looking at page 555, which has the list of fees and their um, adjustments. So it was an engineering <laughs> CCI. I had something to do. What's that? I'm trying to remember. I remember you discussing the reason why it was three year instead of two year. And I can't. Well, it had to do with, didn't have to do with how it was calculated before, it had to do with gas, with, with gasoline tax or something like that, wasn't it, Steve? Originally, yeah, it was a wash dot CCI, a wash dot construction cost index. So now that you're not using the wash dot CCI, I don't think we had any objection to it, but we wanted to double check. Yeah, Does I think so. any other reason why three years would make more sense? I don't know, because that was the question was whether there was anything else that made it more sense to make it three years. No, I think three years is certainly more smoothing. You'll you'll remove some more of the just the mathematical swings, which may not be directly represented because the reason we went away from WashDOT, maybe for a uh, new member I Isaacson's uh, benefit, the WashDOT index is heavily based in straight up oils. So when asphalt's high, oil's high, vice versa, um, we were getting 10 and 30% swings every year. So people would freak out. Um, 
And Dina, I can't remember. I, I, I don't think it really matters between two and three. I think two is certainly reasonable and follows a little bit quicker trend adjustment. Uh, three, again, is a little more smoothing. So just, I think it, I don't think it matters much. So I think I'm, from staff's perspective, we're not objecting to it. We could change it by, by, by motion. It's certainly mm -hmm. less math for finance on a biannual basis. So in, in that sense, a motion on the floor and then an amendment? Uh, I'm happy to make an amendment, but I, I feel like I'm seeing uh, Council Member Isaacson does have a question. Yeah, and just for clarity, this gets approved annually, right? This our, our, yeah. this agenda bill. So yeah. if we amended it today for two year, next year, you could easily come back to us, Steve, and say, hey, actually, we overlooked this and we could convert it back to three, right? So we can keep things moving. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's the whole, that's honestly, that's the whole point by, behind putting it under a resolution so we can make these changes as opposed to going back and changing code. So that's yeah. exactly the point. I can go ahead and make a, a motion then. Okay. I move that we modify the uh, index adjustment for the city's traffic impact fee from the three year January to December average ENR CCI to the two year average ENR CCI determined in January. So correct me if I'm wrong, we have a resolution on the table that needs a motion and then an amendment. We don't have yet have a motion for the resolution. We need the motion for the res and a second for the resolution before we entertain an amendment. Oh. I thought we'd already make one. I think I made one, didn't I? Or am I? Yes, you did. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I, yeah. There, yeah. There was a motion to approve. And, and so, I seconded it. Okay. And the assumption well, is, is that this, this, um, this is to move to approve it with this change or whatever. Okay. I apologize. It's third. I'm on going on my 14th hour today straight. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. Mm. okay. So, uh, council member Naplin has an amendment on the floor. Is there a second? Second. All right. Is there any, any discussion on the amendment that has been moved and seconded? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Amendment passes. Um, and now we'll take a vote um, on the a motion as amended. Um, and it's agenda bill 21-138B, resolution adopting 2022 consolidated fee schedule amended to, and council member Knappen, please insert your language. Um, Cause I will not be able to repeat it. <laughs> council member, you're on mute, I think. Oh. You need me to repeat my entire motion or just repeat the the amendment as the amendment to the motion okay. to make sure you have the language correct for the record. I I have one quick question. We have not already implemented the three year adjustment into the dollar amount that shows in there. So okay, sorry, that's all I want. To, okay, so um, uh, the amendment would be to modify the city's traffic impact fee cost index adjustment from the two from the three year January to December average ENR CCI to the two year average ENR CCI as determined in January. Thank you for completing that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. And with that, we have no further business. So unless there are objections, we are adjourned. And I just want to make note, uh, I think Council Member Isaacson might be the, the lucky, um, lucky star here because this is the first time that we've completed a full agenda before nine o'clock and I can't remember how long. Yeah, uh, so don't, don't get used to it, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't about to be the new person and drag out those conversations on those agenda bills. So, <laughs> so thank you all um, for your expediency and brevity and getting straight to the business. And everyone have a happy new year and great evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night.